All right, so this is going to be a full dynamics review of the McGraw-Hill-Ryerson units one to three um, textbook review. So we'll start with analyzing motion uh, or the grade 11 review uh, section of the units and we'll end with orbital motion uh, towards the end of the video. So I guess this will be split upon nine parts covering um, each um, important topic in these units and I'll try to pick most or most of the important questions to analyze for the, this video. All right, so let's start with question one. A uh, linear accelerator accelerated a germanium ion uh, from rest to a velocity of this over a time interval of 5.5 times 10 negative six seconds. So what was the magnitude of the force that was required to accelerate the ion? Okay, so um, F net equals MA. Um, we have our mass but we're missing our acceleration, so we just use our kinematic equation, right? So um, d, a, v2, v1, and delta t. So um, our displacement, uh, we don't have that, so that's what we're gonna use. Um, our acceleration is what we need to find. Our v2 is, 7.3 times 10 to the 6 meters per second. We start at rest, so that's our v1. And our time is 5.5 times 10 to the negative 6 seconds. Okay, so now we can just um, use our first equation. So uh, v2 equals v1 plus a delta t. And we can isolate for our acceleration. So, um, and before that, we can cross out our v1, knowing that it's zero, right? So, um, acceleration is equal to our final velocity divided by our time so if we plug that in right our acceleration our acceleration is equal to um 7.3 times 10 to the 6 meters per second over um 5.5 times 10 to the negative 6 seconds and you should get an acceleration of <laughs> 1.34 times 10 to the 12 meters per second squared. Okay, from there, we just plug it back into our F net equation, right? So um, F net is equal to um, our mass, which is 7.2 times 10 to the negative 25 kilograms times our acceleration. So I don't, want, I don't have space to write that. So I'm just gonna write A, just know that we're plugging uh, this value in. And when you multiply those two numbers together, you should get an F net of um, 9.63 times 10 to the negative 13 newtons. So yeah, that's question one. That's as simple as it gets. Um, question two, a hockey player exerts an average force of 39 newtons onto a puck of 20 kg um, over a displacement of 0.22 meters. If the hockey puck started from west, what is the final velocity of the puck? And we're assuming that friction is uh, negligible. So I guess the first thing we should do is draw a free body diagram of this puck. So we have our puck, right? And we have an applied force, right? The hockey stick applies a force. Um, we're assuming friction is negligible, right? So we don't have a force of friction. And in our vertical and our vertical components, we have our normal force and our force of gravity. So we want to find the final velocity of the puck. So uh, in order to do that, we just use our acceleration equations, kinematic equations. So uh, displacement, uh, we know that is 0 0.22 meters. Acceleration, that is what we need to, um, we're gonna find from our F net equations. Uh, final velocity, that is what we need to find. That's what we want, that's our like overall end goal. And our V1 is, well, we start from rest, so zero meters per second, and our change in time is negligible, so we don't really care about it, right? So that's the equation we use. We're gonna use kinematic equation number five. Okay, so we need to find our acceleration. So we can say F net equals MA, and this is horizontal, right? And from now on, when I'm talking about F net in the horizontal direction, I'm gonna say, some of the forces in the x direction. This means sigma or sum of, and it's just a fancy way of saying f net in the horizontal direction, but it's a lot faster to write, so that's why I'll use it and a lot neater. 
So yeah, uh, that is equal to m a. So what forces do we have in the next direction? Well, we only have one force. That's our applied force, right? So f a is equal to mass times acceleration. And our mass is um, 0.20 kilograms. And our, our f a, we know, is uh, 39 newtons, right? So let's isolate for a. So acceleration is equal to force applied divided by our mass, and if we plug in our force applied, that is 39 newtons. So 39 newtons over our mass, so 0 0.2, uh, 20 kg. We get an acceleration of, so put that into your calculators, and you get an acceleration of 195, um, 195 meters per second squared. All right. Um, now we can plug that into our kinematic equation. So we know that this is 195 meters per second squared. Okay, so uh, we're going to use kinematic equation number five. So um, that is uh, our final velocity squared is equal to our initial velocity squared plus two times the acceleration times our displacement. And once again, uh, initial velocity is zero, so we can cross that out, right? And we want to isolate for um, our final velocity. Well, it's already on the left side, so all we got to do is uh, square root both sides, right? So uh, you square root this, the square goes away, and we square root this side. So um, root of 2 times our acceleration, which is 195 meters per second squared, times our displacement, which is 0 0.22 meters. All right, so uh, if we put that into our calculators, we should get... So 2 times 195 times 0.22 should get a, a displacement of, sorry, a uh, final velocity of approximately 9.3 meters per second, meters per second, sorry, not meters per second squared. All right, uh, question number four. So we skip number three because, uh, once again, I'm only taking the important questions or non repetitive questions of this textbook or this unit. So yeah, uh, question four, a curling stone with a mass of 20 kg leaves the curler's hand at a speed of 0 0.885 meters per second. It slides 31.5 meters down the ring before coming to a rest. So we, we, we already know that the final velocity is zero, right? Coming to a rest. So uh, first thing we should do is draw for your body diagram of what is going on. So here's our curling stone. And you may be inclined to draw a force applied here, but you gotta remember that the stone is already moving, right? It's moving at a speed of 0 0.885 meters per second. So there's no force applied. It's already been applied. It's already moving. We're taking a snapshot of this puck at a specific point where it's already moving. So the only force acting on it is our force of friction in the, in the horizontal direction, of course. So force of friction, right? Remember, there's no applied force. Don't draw an applied arrow because it's already moving. Okay, so... Um, that's all our forces in the horizontal direction. So I guess we should uh, draw our forces in the vertical direction. So we have our uh, normal force and our force of gravity. So uh, step one wants us to find, or part A wants us to find the average force of friction acting on the stone. So uh, force of friction is equal to mass. Well, before I write that, um, sum of the forces in the x direction, right? F net in the x direction equals ma. There's only one force in the x direction, and that is a uh, force of friction. So that is equal to ma. And we want to find this force of friction. So we have our mass, but we need our acceleration in order to find this force of friction. So where are we going to get that acceleration from? Well, you guessed it, kinematic equations. So uh, displacement, acceleration, final velocity, initial velocity, and our time. So our displacement is 31.5 meters. So... 31.5 meters, our acceleration is what we want to find. So, question mark, our final velocity, well, it comes to a rest. So, zero meters per second. And our initial velocity, right? Because we're already moving, we have an, uh, our initial velocity, that's no applied force. So, that is 0 0.885 meters per second. And our time, well, we don't have, we don't care about. So, that's the equation we're going to use, equation number five. So, um, V2 squared is equal to v1 squared uh, plus 2 times acceleration times our displacement. So um, we want to solve for acceleration, so we're going to isolate for our acceleration. Uh, we know that our v2 is 0, so we can cross that out. Um, 
And now we can move the v1 to the left, right? So v1, negative v1 squared is equal to 2a delta d. And to isolate for acceleration, we'll, uh, we'll smooth the acceleration to the, we'll swap the equation around, right? And we get negative v1 squared over 2 times delta d, right? We're isolating for the acceleration. We're just making our lives easier instead of plugging all the values in. Um, and now we can just plug the values in from here. Okay, so our initial velocity is 0 0.885 meters per second. And we square that. And we divide that by 2 times the displacement. So the displacement is 31.5 meters. So plug that into your calculators and you should get so negative times 0.885 squared. Don't forget the brackets, uh, all over 2 times 31.5. And your acceleration should be negative 0 0.0124 meters per second squared. So it's these it's slowing down at this rate, right? It makes sense because a stone is gonna start slowing down. So your acceleration, it makes sense that your acceleration is negative slowing down in the positive direction, right? Okay, so um, now we plug that into our F net equation, right? So uh, our 20 kg, so that's our M, times uh, negative 0 0.012 meters per second squared, or 24, and our force of friction equals negative 0 0.249 newtons. And that makes sense, right? It should be negative because we're considering this as the westward direction and we're slowing down, right? So, um, yeah, that's our force of friction. So part B wants us to find the coefficient of friction between the ice and the stone. So before I can do that, let me just shorten this so we have more space to do part B. All right. So we want to find the coefficient of friction, kinetic friction between the ice and the stone. So we have a formula for that, right? Force of friction is equal to mu times Fn, where mu is our um, coefficient of kinetic friction. And we can isolate from mu, so mu is equal to our um, force of friction divided by Fn. And remember, these are absolute values, so no vector signs. So we only take the positive values, right, because it's a ratio. So um, mu is equal to 0 0.249 newtons, right, absolute value, over Fn. What is Fn? Well, let's do our sum of the forces in the y direction, vertical direction, and that equals zero, right? There's no motion in the vertical direction. So um, Fn plus Fg equals zero. Fn plus Mg equals zero. So Fn, our normal force, equals negative Mg. And negative Mg is it's the same thing as a positive number, right? This is a negative, this is a negative, negative times negative is a positive. It makes sense because the normal force has to be positive, opposite of the uh, gravitational force. So uh, we could also write this as Fn equals mg with no vector sign on the g. Uh, just, this is just like a little shortcut you can do um, to make your life a lot easier, right? So Fn is equal to mg. So we know Fn is equal to mg and our mass is 20 kg and our, our acceleration due to gravity, that is 9.8 meters per second squared. Remember, we're taking the positive number. So um, mu equals, well, if you do 0.249 over 20 times 9.8, your uh, coefficient of friction should be 0 0.00127 or 1.27 times 10 to the negative three in scientific notation, which I'm not going to continue to write. Okay, so question five. Uh, you are pushing a grocery cart with a force of 95 newtons applied at an angle 35 degrees down from the from the horizontal. Um, uh, it makes the car travel at a constant speed. Okay, so we know that our force in the friction is gonna equal zero, right? Constant velocity, constant speed of 1.2 meters per second. We wanna find the frictional force acting on the cart. Okay, so let's draw a free body diagram of what's going on. Okay, so here's our cart. Uh, here is the horizontal, and we have an applied force, right? And that is, this is our FA, and that's making a 35 degree angle from the horizontal. So we know that our vector components, right? We have a vertical component and a horizontal component of this applied force. So the, 
the vertical component. We call that FAY, so force applied vertically in the Y direction, and our horizontal component. So this is FAX. And we don't really care about our, our vertical component of our um, applied force because that's not going to be useful for finding our force of friction, which is um, going this way, right? And we should make that vector approximately equal to FAX, right? Because it's going at constant uh, velocity, constant speed. So, yeah. Um, so how are we going to get FAX? Well, we have our hypotenuse and we have our adjacent, right? So, our, sorry, we don't have our adjacent. That's what we want to find. So our FA is equal to 95 newtons. So hypotenuse and adjacent, well, what trig ratio is that? That's your cosine theta, right? So cos theta is equal to um, adjacent over hypotenuse. So cos theta is equal to FAX, that's our adjacent, right? Over our hypotenuse, so FA. If we bring this to the other side, we get FAX equals FA cos theta. So you can use that, this formula, for our horizontal component of our applied force from now on. So um, we can say the sum of the forces in the x-direction, that equals zero, right? Because it's moving at a constant velocity. So um, now we can say force of friction plus force applied in the x-direction equals zero. Uh, force of friction is equal to the negative force applied in the next direction, right? Because we're moving it to the right side of the equation, right? Just subtract it. And now we can say our force of friction is equal to negative F A cos theta. So we plug in our values, right? So negative 95 newtons, so that's our F A, times cos of our angle theta, 35 degrees. So our force of friction ends up being so negative 95 times cos of 35 and we get a force of friction of negative 77.81 newtons uh, approximately right um, yeah and you can also say that is 77.81 newtons westward they remember it all depends where we're pushing this cart right so I have defined this as west and this is east. So I guess I should write uh, east and west, positive, negative. And yeah, that's our uh, force of friction that is acting on the cart. Okay, and this force of friction is also equal to the force applied in the next direction, right? Because it's moving at a constant uh, speed or velocity. Okay, uh, question six. A uh, man is walking with the aid of a cane and he approaches a skateboard uh, with a given mass lying on the sidewalk. He pushes it at an angle of 60 degrees down from the horizontal with his cane. Okay, let's picture what's uh, going on with the sketch. So here's a man, he has his cane, right? And he's pushing a skateboard. This is the skateboard um, with an angle of 60 degrees to the horizontal, so 60 degrees to the horizontal. And that's causing our skateboard to move. And we know from part B that it's gonna accelerate, right? So it's not gonna move at constant velocity, it's gonna be accelerating. And I guess we can say this force that he's applying is our applied force, although this is just a sketch, right? We never point our vectors towards the object. So yeah, that's just a rough sketch of what's going on. Now we can draw our free body diagram, which is gonna be pretty similar to the free body diagram of the previous question. So um, here's our free body diagram. We have our force supply, right? And here's our horizontal. And this angle it forms is 60 degrees. And once again, we don't care about the vertical component of our uh, applied force. So this is FAX and friction is negligible. I forgot to mention that. This question does forget to mention that. So uh, we don't uh, put a, a force of friction, right? So um, part A wants us to find the horizontal force acting on the skateboard. There's only one horizontal force acting on the skateboard and that's our force applied in the next direction. So the F net in the X direction, so some of the force in the X direction, is equal to F A X, right? And from our previous question, we derived F A X to be 
um, f a cos theta, right? So our sum of the forces in the x direction, or our total force in the x direction, horizontal direction, is f a, so uh, 115 newtons times cos of the angle, 60 degrees. So you should get a applied force in the x direction of 57.5 newtons. So there we go. And part B asks us to find the initial acceleration of the skateboard. So sum of the forces in the x direction, that is equal to mass times acceleration. Um, we know that that is FAX, right? And that is equal to mass times acceleration. We have our uh, force applied in the x direction. We have our mass, right? It is 3.5 kilograms. So therefore we can solve for our acceleration. So acceleration equals um, force applied, FAX, over the mass. So is equal to 57.5 newtons divided by uh, 3.5 kilograms. Therefore, our acceleration equals 16.4 meters per second squared. Okay, uh, question number seven. A mountain bike with a mass of 13.5 kilograms uh, with a rider having a mass of 63.5 kilograms is traveling at 32 kilometers an hour. Okay, so right off the bat, we know that um, this 32 kilometers per hour, that is not in our scientific uh, units, SI units. So we have to convert that to meters per second. So let's do that real quick. So 32 kilometers per hour, we can use some dimensional analysis, right? So in one hour, there is 3,600 seconds, and in one kilometer, there is 1,000 meters. So we cross out the hours, the kilometers, and we're left with meters per second. So 32 divided by 3,600 uh, times 1,000, and we get 8.8, .8, repeating, or 8.89 meters per second. Okay, so now we can go back to the question. So how far does the bike travel before coming to a stop if the coefficient of kinetic of uh, friction between the rubber tires and the asphalt is uh, 0 0.60? So how far? Well, we know when we see the word far, we got to find our displacement. So let's set up our kinematic equation. So displacement, we're going to put a question mark here. Um, acceleration, uh, V2, our final velocity, our initial velocity, and our change in time. Okay, so... Um, uh, it says before coming to a stop, so we have our final velocity, right? Stop, zero meters per second. Um, we have our initial velocity, that being 32 kilometers per hour, or 8.8 .8 meters per second we derived. So that is 8.89 meters per second. And we're not given the time, and we're not given the acceleration, but we can find the acceleration from our... Um, F net equations, right? So we can get rid of the time. So let's find the acceleration. And from this, we know that we're gonna have to use uh, our kinematic equation number five. Before we can do that, we need to find our uh, acceleration. So let's draw a free body diagram of this mountain bike. Okay, so here's our mountain bike. And the rider applies the brakes, locking the wheels, right? So you may be inclined to write an applied force in this direction, but he's applying a force to slow down the bike. So we write the applied force in the opposite direction of motion. So I'm just gonna say that's the negative direction, right? So this is east, positive, and this is west, negative. So he's applying a force in the westward direction. So we can say this is FA, we can call it FF. I'm gonna call it FA for now. Okay, so FA. And there is no force in, the, in this direction, right? Because we're only slowing down. We have initial velocity. We're traveling at some initial velocity, and we're applying a force to slow down. We're applying a force in the opposite direction of motion, which is this way. So there's no force acting in the eastward direction. However, there are forces acting in our vertical direction, right? We have our normal force and our force of gravity or mg okay so um from here we have everything we need right oh and 
for the sake of this question, it says, uh, it gives us the coefficient of friction between the rubber tire tiles and the road. So I guess we should call this force that we're applying to slow it down a force of friction because that's what it is as well, right? It's a force of friction that you're applying to slow down this bike or the bike is applying a force of friction towards the ground. So um, yeah, that's all you need to solve this question. So now we set up our sum of the forces in the x direction and that equals mass times acceleration. And the only force we have acting on the x direction is our force of friction. So that's equal to mass times um, uh, acceleration. And we wanna find our acceleration. And what are we given? Well, we're given um, our mass, right? We have the mass. However, we're not given the um, force of friction. So we can define our force of friction. And in order to find our force of friction, we can use our um, force of friction equals mu times Fn equation. So we're given mu, right? But we're not, that is 0 0.60, but we're not given Fn. Where are we gonna get Fn from? Well, if you remember from the previous questions, we can say Fn equals mg, right? Some of the forces in the vertical direction equals zero. So um, we can say that Fn equals mg. So we have our Fn. So now we can say force of friction equals mu mg. And I write it like this because I'm gonna show you a neat little trick you can use um, to simplify this equation even more. So we wanna find our acceleration, right? So our acceleration is equal to our force of friction divided by our mass. We said our force of friction is equal to mu mg and, sorry, I should have said that that is equal to negative mu mg, right? Because this is a absolute value. And when we add the vector sign, we add direction to it. And we're saying the friction is in the westward direction or negative. So we say negative mu mg. So our acceleration is equal to negative mu times m times g all over m. And look at that, we can cancel out our m's. That is why I wrote it like this, instead of actually finding our force of friction, which you could have done, right? You would have had to use um, these two masses, like you'd add 63.5 and 13.5 kilograms, right? Because the mountain bike with the rider, and you'd plug your g value and your mu value, and then you do the same thing, right? Well, this way, you have very simplified equation. Um, you can write your acceleration is equal to negative mu times g. And from there, I could solve for the acceleration, but I'll plug that in at the very end. So now we have our acceleration. So that is equal to negative mu g. Uh, if you want, you can plug it in, right? You can plug your negative zero point um, 60 times 9.8, but I'll do that at the very end, right? Because we want to make this as simple as possible. And from now on, I'm going to be doing a lot of that. I'm, being, I'm going to be doing a lot of simplifying and canceling out, canceling the masses out. And remember, we're allowed to cancel these masses out because of the conservation of energy laws, right? Okay, so um, we're going to be using kinematic equation number five, right? So uh, V2 squared is equal to V1 squared uh, plus two times our acceleration times our displacement. And we want to isolate for um, the displacement. So let me just make this a little smaller so we have more space to work with. So now we just have to isolate for our displacement. So we know that our final velocity is zero, so we can just can cancel that out. And we bring this uh, V2 to the left side, right? So, sorry, V1, so negative V1 squared is equal to two times our acceleration times our displacement and divide both sides by 2a right so our displacement is equal to negative v1 squared over two times the acceleration so our displacement is equal to negative so bracket our v1 we said was 8.89 meters per second right and you square that over uh, two times the acceleration. And we define the acceleration to be negative mu mg, which we can also write as negative 0 0.60, right? That's our coefficient of friction, mu 
times g, so times 9.8 meters per second squared. And from there, we can say our displacement is equal to, well, plug that into your calculator, so negative bracket 8.89 squared all over 2 times uh, negative 0.60 times 9.8. And you should get a value of 6.72 meters, approximately. So, therefore, our um, displacement, or how far does the bike come before coming to a complete stop, our bike comes goes 6.72 meters before coming to a complete stop. And yeah, that is the end of the grade 11 review of the dynamic section of um, this textbook. So yeah, that's as easy as it gets. Let's head into part two of this video. All right, everybody, this is part two of the physics units one to three review. Um, this will be the first actual questions covering grade 12 topics. So um, we will be covering Newton's third law along with connected objects. So let's get started. Uh, a 1700 kg car is towing a larger vehicle a mass of 2400 kg the two vehicles accelerate uniformly uh, from a stoplight reaching a speed of 15 kilometers an hour in 11 seconds okay so we're gonna have to change this into si units meters per second and we need to find the force uh needed to accelerate the connected vehicles as well as the minimum strength in the road between them okay so we need to find the strength in this force the the, the strength in this rope the force right and we need to find the minimum force or strength Sorry, and we need to find the force needed to accelerate both these vehicles. So um, I guess the first thing we should do is label our masses, right? So we'll call this mass two and this mass one. So this, so this is gonna be a two-parter question. So let's start with our free body diagrams. And we're gonna draw three free body diagrams and I'll show you why in just a sec. So the first free body diagram is that of M2, so our second mass. And here we go, this is our second mass. And this question fails to remind us that friction is negligible. So for this question, friction does not exist. It's not there. So we only have one force acting on mass two. So what is that force? Well. It's not an applied force, it's a tensional force. It's our force of tension. And this force of tension, well, it's positive if we're labeling this as the positive direction, right? So we write positive sign over that. Okay, so now let's draw a free body diagram of M1. So here's our free body diagram of M1. And look at that, we have another force of tension acting in the westward direction or the negative direction. So what does this show us or what does this tell us? Well, it's uh, abiding Newton's third law, right? For every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction force. These two tensional forces have the same magnitude, just opposite in direction. And we can also write these forces as F1 on two. So what does that mean? That means the force that one, mass one, or the first car, is applying on the second car. So the force that this guy is pulling on this guy. So we can say this is F1 on two. And similarly, we can say this is F2 on one, the force that this second car is pulling this first car. So we can either write this as FT positive and FT negative, or F1 on two, or F2 on one whatever you prefer. Um, and now we draw the final uh, free body diagram, and that is of the system. So what is the system? Okay, so we're gonna write system. So the system considers both of these masses as one. We add the two masses together and we draw a free body diagram considering it as one mass. Right? We don't really care about this tensional force for the system. We only care about the force acting on these two cars considered as one. And that will be the force needed to accelerate the connected vehicles, right? So we draw. Here's our free body diagram of our system. I'm just going to draw it a little wider so it, you can be better visualize what is going on. So inside of here, we're going to have mass 1 plus mass 2. So M1 plus M2. And 
we have a force applied. That is the only force acting on these two cars as a system, right? Because there's no friction. Oh, and I forgot to write a force applied on our mass one. Sorry about that. Because remember, our mass one, we have our tensional force, right? And we have an applied force that this car is applying. But don't get that confused with uh, the free body diagram of the system, right? There's no tensional force because we're considering this as one. So we only have an applied force. And of course, friction is negligible. Okay. So now that we have that, we can solve for the force needed to accelerate the connected vehicles. Okay, so how are we gonna do that? Well, we have everything we need to solve that, right? So sum of the forces equals MA. Um, we only have one force acting on it, right? So force supply equals mass total, right? MA mass total, so mass one plus mass two times our acceleration. Okay, so what do we have? We have our mass total. We need to find this guy, FA, but we're missing our acceleration. So we can use our simple um, acceleration equation. We don't even have to use our kinematic equations, right? It's a uh, change in V over change in T that is equal to acceleration. So what is our change in V, right? We're given our V1, we're given our V2. However, we have to change this 15 kilometers an hour, two meters per second. So let's do that real quick. So 15 kilometers per hour. So times one hour. In one hour, there's 3,600 seconds. And in one kilometer, there is 1,000 meters. So if you plug those numbers into your calculator through some dimensional analysis, you should get 4.16. 4.16 meters per second or 4.167 meters per second. Okay, so erase this real quick. So our acceleration is equal to uh, 4.16 meters per second, right? It's a change. So V2 minus V1. So 4.16 minus zero is just 4.16 and that over the time, so over 11 seconds. So our acceleration equals 4.167, right? I'll just write 4.167 because that's what it's better rounded to, over 11. And we get an acceleration of 0 0.38 approximately meters per second squared. Okay, so now that we have that, we have everything we need to solve for our force applied or the force needed to accelerate the connected vehicles. So force applied equals mass total. So mass one plus mass two times our acceleration. So times 0 0.38 meters per second squared. So FA equals, well, mass one is 2,400, right? So 24 kg plus 1700 kg times 0 0.38 meters per second squared. So we plug that all into our calculators. So 2400 plus 1700 uh, times 0.38. And we should get a uh, force applied of about 1558 newtons. So that is our uh, force needed to accelerate uh, the vehicles. So step two, or part two of this uh, two-parter, we need to find the, the minimum strength of the rope between them. So we need to find the force of tension. And there's two ways of finding the force of tension. And you know what, for the sake of it, I'm gonna show both ways. First, I'm gonna show the easier one. And I'll show you both ways so that I can prove that these force of tensions will be the same no matter what way you solve it. And when it when questions ask for the force of tension, we're not really ever asking for the direction, right? We're only ever asking for the magnitude because that's really what only matters. The direction of the force of tension is relative to what you assign it to be. So um, yeah, let's solve for the force of tension using mass two. Before we do that, let me just make this a little smaller. Okay, so using mass two is gonna be a lot easier. So we're gonna use mass two. 
Why is it easier? Well, we only have one force acting on it, right? So sum of the forces equals mass ma, but m, our m is m2a in this case, right? Because we're using mass 2. So ft equals m2a, and our ft equals, so our mass 2 is 2400 kg times our acceleration, which we said was 0 0.38 meters per second squared. So that leaves us with a force, a tensional force of, so 2,400 times 0.38, and we get a tensional force of 912 newtons. Okay, so that was using mass two. So let's solve this using mass one, so we can prove Newton's third law. Okay, so um, the sum of the forces equals m1a, right? We're using m1 now. Um, and we have two forces acting on this. So we have Ft plus our force applied, and that is equal to m1a. And we have our force applied, right? We found that. It's 1,558 newtons. So we can say Ft equals m1a minus our force applied. So our force of tension is equal to m1 is 1,700 kg times our acceleration so times 0 0.38 meters per second squared minus fa so minus 1558 newtons therefore our force of tension in the m1 for mass 1 is so 1700 times 0 0.38 minus 1558 and look at that, we get negative 912 newtons. And that makes sense, right? In mass one, we said our force of tension is negative. And in mass two, we said our force of tension is positive. And as you can see, these have the same magnitude, just opposite direction, right? Uh, following uh, Newton's third law. So yeah, we just proved Newton's third law. Um, we solved for the minimum strength of the rope between them using both M1 and M2. Obviously, M2 is a lot easier. However, in the next question, you're going to see that um, M2 and M1 are pretty much equal difficulty when solving. It's not always going to be one is easier than the other. So let's head on to the next question. All right, uh, question nine. So a nice skater pulls three small children, one, with, one behind the other, uh, with masses of 25, 31, and 35 kilograms. Assume that the ice is smooth enough to be considered frictionless. Okay, so we know that the ice is frictionless. Um, part A wants us to find the total force applied on the train of children if they reach a speed of 3.5 meters in 3.5 meters per second in 15 seconds. Okay, so I guess we can for part A. So A, we only really have to draw the free body diagram of the system, right? We only need the total of force. Uh, applied on the train of children. Okay, so let's draw a free body diagram of the system. So here's our little system, including all three masses inside. Remember, we don't care about the tensional forces for the system, and friction is negligible, so the only force on the system is the force that the initial ice skater is pulling these children these three small children. So that is our applied force. And inside of here, we'll have our mass one plus mass two plus mass three. And I guess those should be lowercase m's, right? Okay, so um, the acceleration we need. So first thing, let's set up our F net equations, right? So F net equals ma. And we only have one force acting on this, right? So force applied that is equal to um, mass total times acceleration, which is the same thing as saying mass one plus mass two plus mass three times our acceleration. Okay, so we have mass one, mass two, mass three. We need to find FA and we're missing our acceleration. So we can get that from our uh, acceleration equation, right? So acceleration is equal to our change in V over change in T. So 3.5 meters per second over 15 seconds. And we should get a value of approximately 0 
repeating um, meters per second squared. All right, so if we plug that in for FA, so, sorry, if we plug that in for A, so M1 is 25 kg, M2 is 31 kg, and M3 is 35 kg. Multiply that by our acceleration, so 0 0.23 meters per second squared. Plug that into your calculators. So 25 plus 31 plus 35 bracket. Multiply that by 0 0.233. And you should get a applied force. So our force applied is approximately 21.2 Newtons. So that is the force or the applied force that the initial skater is applying on this train of children. Okay, so part B says that the skater is holding on to the 25 kilogram child. Find the tension in the arms of the child next in line. Okay, so let's draw a little rough sketch of um, what is going on in this situation. So let me just make this smaller because we're gonna need a lot of space for this. Okay, so we have three masses, right? Okay, let me just draw that over here. So we have three masses. This, I'll call this mass, mass three. This mass, mass two. This mass, sorry, this mass, mass one. And we have our skater Here's our skater, right? He's applying a force, pulling the three children, or the three masses, this way, which I'm defining as east. I'm saying he's pulling them eastward, right? Okay, so I guess we should label the masses, right? So we're, it says that the skater is holding on to a 25 kilogram child. Okay, so this is the 25 kg. Um, and they're one behind another, right? So this is 25, this should be 31, and this should be 35 kg. And yep, those are all the forces acting on this. Remember, there is no force of friction as we are considering it to be negligible. All right, so um, now let's draw a free body diagram of each mass individually. Although we don't have to, I want to show you both ways of solving this question just so that you can see how uh, the third law applies to the tensional forces and that um, they, will both up, they will both end up equaling each other. So with opposite um, directions, of course. Okay, so let's draw a free body diagram of um, M3, so mass three. So in mass three, we only have a tensional force, right? And we can call this FT, let's call this FT2. So this is FT2. And this force of tension two is positive. It's going eastward. So that's um, mass three. Okay, now we have our second mass. So this is mass two. And we have that same force of tension, right? However, it is going westward. It is in the opposite direction. It is negative. We're saying it's negative. Remember, we're assigning these directions, right? It doesn't really matter as long as they're opposite directions. And on top of that force of tension too, we have another force of tension. This one being um, FT1. And I'm going to draw this FT1 vector a little larger than this one, right, than the FT2 vectors, because the closer you get to the front, the more, um, the more tension there is in the rope, right? This rope is holding on to, it's requiring more tension on these two masses, whereas this rope is only really, like, pulling this mass and this mass, right? Okay, so um, that is our M2. And final free body diagram is for our... Um, M1, so mass 1, and we'll say this is FT1, and I forgot to label positive here and negative here, and we have our force applied. 
Okay, so you can solve this um, a variety of ways, right? So if we were to start from scratch, it wouldn't really matter if we solved uh, mass 3 to get mass 2 first or um, FA to get um, uh, mass 2 first, right? However, since we already solved for FA, the faster way to solve this would be um, through using M1. So I guess that's the way we're going to show first. And then I'm going to show you the other way to solve this so I can prove that um, these tensional forces are equal in magnitude and opposite direction, right? Okay, so I'm going to write using mass 1. So sum of the forces is equal to mass times acceleration. And we have two forces acting on this, right? So force applied plus our force of um, tension. And that is equal to mass times acceleration. And sorry, I should have put mass one over here because we're focusing on mass one. So our force of tension is equal to mass one times acceleration minus our force applied, right? We just bring it to the other side. Therefore, our force of tension equals, we plug all these values in. We said mass 1 is 25 kg. So 25 kg. And our acceleration, we said, is 0.23 meters per second squared. And we subtract that from the applied force we found from the previous question, that being uh, 21.2 newtons. So... Um, Right, if you multiply this, you'll get newtons. Newtons minus newtons, you're still in newtons. So your force of tension equals, so 25 times 0.23 minus 21.2. And you get a force of tension of negative 15.45 newtons. And that makes sense, right? This force of tension is negative. And from there, we pretty much answer the question, right? It's asking, if a skater is holding on to the 25 kg child, find the tension in the arms of the next child in line. So that's the tension in this guy's arms, right? So this tensional force, and we could find this one or this one, doesn't matter, because we only really care about the magnitude of the tension. So yeah, that's pretty much it, but I'm gonna show you how we can solve this using um, mass three and then mass two, which is a little bit more tricky, but you pretty much get the same answer, just just a little proof that's pretty cool. So using mass three, we have some forces and that is equal to M3A. We only have one force acting on this, right? There's no friction. So FT2 is equal to mass three times our acceleration. So that is mass three being 35 kilograms. So 35 kg times our acceleration being 0.23 meters per second squared, and that would make our F2, T2, if we plug that in, right? So 35 times 0.23, that would make it 8.05 8 newtons. And we can call this FT2 um, force of two on one. So the force that this mass two is pulling, sorry, force of two on three, my bad. So the force that this mass two is pulling on mass three, so that's like this force, right? This guy is pulling mass three, so we call that force of two on three, and that is equal to 8.05 newtons. That is a positive number. Okay, so um, let's make this a little smaller. So now we just need to solve for FT1, right? So using, so using M2, the sum of the forces, that is equal to M2A. Okay, so um, the sum of the forces would be FT2 plus FT1, and that is equal to M2A. However, what FT2 are we going to use for this, right? We're not going to use this, this one that we found, right? We're going to be using F3 on 2. So that is the force that 3 is pulling on 2. So this FT2. 
And these FTs, these force of tensions, these tensional forces, have the same magnitude, just opposite direction. So we say this is negative 8.05 newtons. So we can write this as um, FT1 plus FT2. And this FT2 comes from the mass 3 on 2, so that is a negative number, right? So our force of tension one, that is equal to M two A minus F T two. So since we're saying minus negative 8.05, that is the same thing as saying plus 8.05, right? Minus times a uh, minus is positive or minus minus a minus is positive. So F T one, that is equal to mass 2, that being 31 kilograms, so 31 kg, times our acceleration, 0 0.23 meters per second squared, plus 8.05 newtons, right? Where this is the same thing as saying minus negative 8.05, so that's just plus. Okay, so now our FT1, and this FT1 is the same as um, F. 2, sorry, F1 on 2. So the force that um, 1 is pulling on 2, so like that, right? So if everything uh, is correct, we should get the same value that we got here, just opposite signs, right? So 31 times 0.23 plus 8.05. And look at that, it's approximately equal to um, 15.18 newtons. So because we rounded, right, this is supposed to be 0.23 repeating, um, we're going to get a different number, right? But it's pretty much the same. Just because we rounded, we got a different number. So we can say that um, FT1 is equal to FT1. Right? They have the same magnitudes. However, they have these FT1s have opposite directions, right? I guess I should say that uh, this FT1 over here is the same as um, F2 on 1. So the force that 2 is uh, pulling on mass 1. So yeah, there's a uh, proof for um, the third law and... Um, how these tensional forces have the same magnitude in opposite direction. Although you don't have to do all this work, right? All you have to do is use mass one and solve for FT. So yeah, that's pretty much it for the first part of the grade 12 review. Um, all right, this is uh, part three of the physics units one to three review. Um, a 64 kilogram person is standing on a scale in an elevator. The elevator is rising at a constant velocity, but then begins to slow with an acceleration of 0 0.59 meters per second squared. What is the sign of the acceleration? What is the reading on the scale while the elevator is accelerating? Okay, so during these next couple of questions, we're going to be covering uh, apparent weight. So what is apparent weight? Well, apparent weight is the weight you feel uh, that is apparent to your actual weight, right? So for example, in an elevator, right? So here's our elevator. I guess I should draw the forces acting on the elevator, although that is not important for these um, apparent weight questions. We have our scale, right? And this scale is going to be applying a normal force, which we can also call as the force of the scale on person, so Fs on P. So this force of the scale on the person is dependent on the acceleration. If the acceleration is positive, uh, your scale will display a heavier um, weight, right? Your weight will be greater. If the acceleration is negative, well, vice versa, your weight will appear to be less, right? If you're ever riding in an elevator and you start to speed up, you will feel heavier and you wonder why. Well, that's your apparent weight. You're not actually heavier, it's just what you feel for the moment, right? And through these next couple of questions, we're gonna be understanding why that works and the physics behind it, right? Okay, so let's start with question one.
Question 11. So I guess we should draw a proper free body diagram of what's going on. So we're really only drawing a free body diagram of this scale, right? We don't really care about the elevator for now, maybe for the next questions we do. But uh, yeah, so let's draw a free body diagram of this. And from now on, I'll just draw my free body diagram diagrams like this. It's a lot easier and more convenient, right? So this is our Fn or, or the force of the scale on the person. And this is our Fg, right? There is always the force acting down. So the first part of the question asks us, what is the sign of the acceleration? Well, they try to trick us here, saying the cons constant velocity, blah, 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 right? But the only part that we're looking at is it begins to slow down with an acceleration of 0 0.59 meters per second squared, right? So it is rising and it begins to slow down, right? So since it's rising and it slows down, the acceleration is negative. So I guess part A will say acceleration is negative. And that is negative 0 0.59, right? So negative 0 0.59 meters per second squared, okay? so. Part B wants us to uh, find the reading on the scale while the elevator is accelerating. Okay, so that is the more important part of this question. So, um, say part B. So, first thing, set up our F in that equation, right? So, that is equal to um, MA, right? We're not at constant velocity. They try to trick us, right? Yeah, it begins to slow down with an acceleration of 0 0.5. Now, that's the only part that matters. So um, the sum of the forces, we only have our normal force and our force of gravity, so plus Fg, and that is equal to ma. So our acceleration, we said, is negative 0 0.59 meters per second squared, and Fg is equal to mg, right? So we can say Fn is equal to ma minus mg so this is the same thing as saying ma plus so this is the same thing as saying fn is equal to ma plus mg with no vector sign right because this is a negative this is a negative and that equals a positive so we can say from now on well you know i'll get to that a little, a little later so our normal force so the force that the scale is applying on the person or the reading on the scale at this moment is equal to, so the mass of the person is 64 kg times our acceleration, that being uh, negative 0 0.59 meters per second squared, plus um, 64 kg times our acceleration, 9.8 meters per second squared. And we could have uh, common factored an m here, right? We could have said um, m plus, sorry, m times a plus g and from now on i'm going to be doing that right i'm going to be common factor and i just want to show you using this way if you're more familiar with it so our normal force is equal to so 64 times negative 0.59 and we add another 64 times 9.8 therefore the force that the scale is applying on the person is 589.44 newtons and if you want to find the actual weight so this is the apparent weight right apparent weight and because the acceleration is negative our apparent weight should be less right so when if you're ever in an elevator right and you're going upwards and you start to um, slow down you're gonna start feeling lighter and that is the apparent weight that you're feeling. So let's prove that we're feeling lighter, right? So what is our actual weight? So our weight is Fg, and that is equal to Mg. So Fg is equal to M, that being uh, 64 kg times 9.8 meters per second squared. I guess we should write a negative. And our actual weight is 64 times 9.8. So that is 60. Uh, 627.2 newtons right so our actual weight is greater than our apparent weight right it's greater so that means that um 
we are um, our acceleration is negative if that makes any sense right just try to picture this right if you're ever in an elevator you'll or even a plane right you'll notice that you feel lighter during certain moments or heavier during so certain moments and that is your apparent weight versus your actual weight remember this weight is not your actual weight it's just a what you feel at the moment don't get that confused okay so now that you have the concept down i will be moving on to the next question okay uh question 12 a 75 kilogram man is standing on a scale in an elevator when the elevator begins to descend with an acceleration of 0 0.66 meters per second right squared what is the direction of the acceleration what is the reading on the scale okay this is the same type of question so part a what is the direction of the acceleration well we're descending at an acceleration of 0 0.66 meters per second squared we're uh, speeding up in the negative direction so our acceleration so acceleration equals negative it is negative so we can say negative 0 0.66 meters per second squared okay so part b what is the reading um on the scale in the elevator so free body diagram right fn or f scale on person and um fg so um sum of the forces is equal to mass times acceleration um the forces we got acting are fn and we can say minus mg because we know mg is negative right and that is equal to ma so fn is equal to ma plus mg notice how i don't have the vector signs on the g because from now on i'm just going to be solving the questions like this it's a lot easier um, so Fn equals, so we common factor in A, so A plus G, and from there we have our, we can say this is our apparent weight equation. So Fn equals our mass, that being 75 kg times our acceleration, which we said was negative 0 0.66 meters per second squared plus our gravity acceleration due to gravity, 9.8 meters per second squared. So Fn, that equals, so 75 times negative 0.66 plus 9.8, and you should get 685.5 newtons. And if you want to test that out versus your actual weight, it should be less, right? Unless you did it wrong, given that your acceleration is negative. So this is your parent weight, right? Okay, so next question. Um, question number 13. Okay, so a, four, a 549 Newton woman, so this time they're giving us the weight of the woman. Uh, she is standing on a scale in an elevator that is going down at a constant velocity. Once again, they're giving us constant velocity, trying to trick us. Um, then the elevator begins to slow down and eventually comes to a stop. The magnitude of the acceleration is 0 0.73 uh, meters per second squared. What is the direction of the acceleration? So this time we got to find the direction of acceleration using a little bit more thinking, right? So and then part B asks for what is the reading on the scale? Okay, so we're going on an elevator that is initially going down, right? So we're going down and um, the elevator begins to slow down and when it's slowing down, it's slowing at 0 0.73 meters per second squared. So you may think that because it's slowing down, this is a negative 0 0.3 meters per second squared, right? But you're actually slowing down in the negative direction. So because you're slowing down in the negative direction, that's a negative times a negative, right? And that is equal to a positive. If you take in any calculus courses, you should know that your acceleration is the second derivative of your position in time, right? P of T. So um, we look at the direction and the uh, speed. So if they're both slowing down, if they're both negative, then our acceleration is positive, right? So um, therefore, acceleration equals a positive value. A okay, part B, what is the direction of the acceleration? Okay, so we do the same thing, right? Fn, mg, 
sum of the forces equals m a and uh, f n plus m g, right? Um, sorry, f n minus m g equals m a, and we can say f n is equal to m a plus m g, so f n is equal to mass and then a plus g, right? So now we just plug in our values. So f n is equal to the mass, so that is, well, we're gonna have to find that mass. How are we gonna get that mass? Well, we're given the weight of the woman, so that is 549 newtons. And from there, we can find our mass, right? F g equals m g, where m is equal to f g over g. So m is equal to 549 over 9.8, right? So our mass is equal to 549 divided by 9.8, and that is 56 kg. So fn equals 56 kg times our acceleration, which is positive. So uh, 0 0.73 meters per second squared plus our acceleration due to gravity. So negative, nine, sorry, not negative because we're not using the vectors. So plus 9.8 meters per second squared. Therefore, our apparent weight or the force that the scale applies on the person at this given moment in time. So 56 times 0 0.73 plus 9.8. And we get uh, 500 and 89.68 newtons so if you wanted to test this out this um apparent weight should be greater than your actual weight right if you ever you're ever in an elevator and you're slowing down and you're going down you're going to start to feel heavier right and that is your apparent weight even though you're slowing down you may think that your since your acceleration is negative you you're, you're slowing down your velocity is negative, you may think that you're going to feel lighter, right? But since you're slowing down in the negative direction, that these two negatives multiply to a positive, which make it so that your acceleration is positive, thus your apparent weight is greater than your actual weight. Okay, so that's question 13. Question um, 18. A 485 kilogram elevator is rated to hold 15 people of average mass of 75 kilograms. The elevator cable can withstand a maximum tension of 3.74 times 10 to the fourth Newton, which is twice the maximum force load uh, that the load will create. So it needs a 200% safety factor, right? So what is the greatest acceleration that the elevator can have with, these, with this maximum load? Okay, so this is a typical application question, right? It's more of a real life scenario. In the real world, we're gonna have to have safety factors, right? So you gotta account for this 200% safety factor. So I guess the first thing we should do is draw a free body diagram. So this time, we're gonna draw a free body diagram of the elevator, including the tensional force and our um, uh, mg, right? So I guess I should make that a little smaller. <laughs> okay, so the mass, I guess that's the first thing we're gonna find. So mass, that is equal to the elevator, the mass of the elevator. So 45 kg plus um, 15 times 75 kg right because there's 15 people inside of this elevator um of an average mass of 75 kilograms so we add these two masses together to get a mass of 1610 kilograms okay so it says that the Elevator can withstand the maximum force of tension of 3.74 times 10 to the fourth newtons. However, we want a 200% safety factor, meaning um, we want to be 200% like 
sure that this cable will not break. So how can we be two, how can we create a two hundred percent safety factor? Well, we'd have to divide this force of tension by two. So force of tension divide by two. So that is three point seven four times ten to the fourth newtons over two, and that equals. So you put that into your uh, calculators. You should get a tensional force of. 1800 so 18,700 um, newtons right no longer in scientific notation so now it asks us what is the greatest acceleration that the elevator can have with the maximum load okay so we have the maximum load we have the 200 percent safety factor and now this just becomes a standard um f nut equation right so sum of the forces is equal to mass times uh, acceleration so Ft minus mg equals ma. Um, we want to solve for the acceleration. So our acceleration equals Ft minus mg all over m. And let's go over here. So our acceleration is equal to 18,700 newtons, right? minus our mass that being 610 kg times our acceleration due to gravity 79.8 meters per second squared all that over the mass being 1610 kg so you put that into your calculators right so 18,700 minus 610 times 9.8 all over 610 kilograms your acceleration should equal approximately 1.81 uh, meters per second squared. And although the question does not ask for the um, uh, apparent weight, let's just find it for fun, right? While we're at it, while we're in this apparent weight section, we can do that. So because our acceleration is positive, right? our apparent weight should be greater than our um than our actual weight so now we have the free body diagram of the scale so of the yeah the scale on the people so uh this is fn or f scale on person and this is fg and remember now we're only looking inside the elevator right so this is fn so we're no longer going to be using the mass of the um elevator right we're only going to be using the mass of the 15 people so um so our mass is 15 times 75 kg so our mass would equal um so 15 times 75 so that's 1125 kilograms so let's i guess we should calculate our actual weight first right so uh fg equals mg um fg equals 1125 times 9.8 and our fg equals uh 11,025 newtons okay so now we should find our apparent weight so um uh F N and we derive this apparent weight uh, equation right from our previous questions. So F N equals M times A plus G. So that equals M times A plus G. So F N equals our mass, that being uh one thousand two hundred one thousand one hundred and twenty-five kg. So times our um acceleration which we said was um positive 1.81 1 um, 1 meters per second squared sorry i meant to put a point there and we add our, our acceleration due to gravity so fn equals so 1125 times 1.81 plus 9.8 and we get a um apparent weight 
of 13,061 newtons. And as we can see, our um, Fn is greater than our Fg, which means our acceleration is positive, which we found from part one of this question. Well, from the question, because I just made up this part of the question. So yeah, that's uh, parent weight. Uh, these are pretty much all the type of questions that can show up. And let's move on to part four of this review. All right, so this is part four of the physics units one to three review. So we'll be covering uh, Atwood machines. Okay, so an Atwood machine make, uh, consists of masses 3.8 and 4.2 kg respectively. What is the acceleration of the masses and what is the tension of the rope? So let's draw ourselves a little Atwood machine, right? And I'll draw the heavier mass on the right side because that's how I find it easier to solve these type of questions. So this is our heavier mass, so I'll say this is mass two, and this will be our lighter mass. So this is mass one. All right, so as always, uh, we draw our free body diagrams, right? So like the connected objects, we're gonna have three free body diagrams. So free body diagrams. So one of these system, and the system is going to contain uh, both of the masses. So here's our mass 1 plus mass 2. So what forces do we have acting on the system? Well, we take these two strings, right? And we imagine that we pull them apart. We pull them like this. So if we pull them like this, what forces do we have acting, right? Like it's not, it's a hypothetical. We have our positive force of gravity. And we'll have our, let me just draw this one more time. So we'll have our positive force of gravity and our negative force of gravity. Of course, gravity is always negative. It's just that we're extending these two masses out, right? So if the masses are like this, we're extending them out and we're assigning a positive and negative direction for our two forces acting, right? There's a force of gravity acting this way and a force of gravity acting this way. Although they're both negative, when we extend them out, they're acting in opposites, opposite directions of each other. So, um, which force of gravity is going to be greater? Well, the force of gravity acting on mass 2, right? Because it's the heavier mass. So, this Fg is going to be heavier, and we're going to call this Fg2. And let's label that as positive. Then, the other, and it's going to be heavier than the other Fg, right? So, uh, this is fg1 and we label that as negative so now that we have a free body diagram of the system we can draw our individual free body diagrams so let's do free body diagram of mass one so here's mass one right and what forces do we have acting on mass one well as we said before there is a force of gravity right but we have another force, and this is our tensional forces, right? We go back to our connected masses units. This tensional force is going to be the same as this tensional force, just opposite uh, directions, same magnitude. So we have our Fg1, and that's going to be negative, and we have our force of tension, and that's going to be positive, right? So uh, now we can draw one for mass 2, so free body diagram mass 2, and we're going to have our Ft1 in the negative direction, so Ft1, or just Ft, because there's only one force of tension, and our force of gravity, our positive force of gravity pulling in the positive direction. So this is our Fg2, and we'll label this as positive. Remember, we're assigning these directions. I'm saying that clockwise, so this is clockwise, that's positive, and counterclockwise is negative. So when we stretch these out, right, this will be positive and this will be negative. Just always try to visualize stretching these two strings out. It makes the whole uh, Apple machine type of problems a lot easier to solve. Okay, so now we can start with the actual problem. So what is the, ten what is the acceleration of the masses? So where are we going to get that from? Well, we can get that from our system. So let me just make everything a little so let's start with our system so system and that includes mass one plus mass two 
I guess I should label the masses, right? This is 3.8 and this is 4.2. And obviously the 4.2 kg is gonna be lower because it's heavier, right? It's pulling uh, more on the, lo the lighter mass. Okay, so sum of the forces, that is equal to mass total times our acceleration. And what forces do we have acting on our system? Well, we stated there's Fg2, which is positive, and we have plus Fg1, which is negative, and that is equal to mass total times our acceleration. So instead of having to like write positive and negative here, right, that kind of becomes redundant, we can just say this is fg2 minus fg1 with no vector signs, right? So that is equal to m total times our acceleration. And from here, we can use um, some of our factoring knowledge to solve for this, right? So uh, fg is equal to mg. So this is m2g, and that's subtracted by m1g. And that is equal to mass 1 plus mass 2. Uh, times our acceleration. So from here, we can common factor a g. So we have mass 2 minus mass 1, and that is equal to mass 1 plus mass 2 times our acceleration. And now we can solve for acceleration, right? So our acceleration is equal to our gravity times mass 2 minus mass 1 all over mass 1 plus mass 2. So let's plug in our values. So um, 9.8 meters per second squared. And mass 2 is 4.2 kg. Mass 1 being 3.8 kg. All over 4.2 kg plus uh, 3.8 kg. And if you put that into your calculators, you should get an acceleration approximately 0 0.49 meters per second squared. So that is uh, part A of these, this question. Okay, so part B wants us to find the tension in the rope. Okay, so we can use either mass 2 or mass 1 to solve this, right? Just like the connected objects, there's multiple ways to solve these type of questions. So um, let's use mass 1. Okay, so uh, using mass 1, so sum of the forces, that is equal to mass 1 times acceleration, right, ma, mass 1 times acceleration, and what forces we have acting on mass 1, well, we have our, um, we have our force of tension, and then we have our negative gravity, right, so we can just say minus fg, right, with no vectors, and that is equal to uh, mass 1 times acceleration, so we have mass 1, we have our acceleration, and we have m g, right? I should have wrote fg1. So we can solve for ft. So ft, or force of tension, is equal to m1a plus, well, we know fg1 is equal to mg1, so plus m, m1, sorry, fg1 is equal to m1g, so m1g. So our force of tension is equal to, we can common factor a mass 1, so mass 1 times acceleration plus g with no vector sign so our force of tension is equal to well we said mass one was 3.8 uh, kilograms and we multiply that by the acceleration we found being 0 0.49 and add that by our acceleration due to gravity <laughs> and if you put that into your uh, calculators you should get approximately 39 newtons so that is the tension in the rope um uh in, in this atwood machine right and we could use mass 2 it gives us the same answer uh except our tension would be negative right as we proved in the connected objects section of this um unit review all right uh question 20 so as you can see i already had the atwood machine put in so um a smaller mass on the output machine is 5.2 kg. So this is the smaller mass, 5.2 kg. Let's call this M1. 
Um, if the mass is accelerated at 4.6 meters per second squared, what is the mass of the second object? So this will be m2, and we want the mass of the second object, so we don't know what this is. Um, okay, so let's draw our free body diagrams. So FBD system. So here's our system, right? We have AFG2, which is greater than our FG1. We have for mass one, we have FG1 acting this way, and we have a tensional force acting this way, which is positive. And this will be negative, so positive, negative. And then for mass two, same magnitude opposite direction for this tensional force. And for the second gravity, FG2, it is positive. Okay, so we can solve this pretty much using either the system or mass one, right? Um, so they want us to find the mass of the second object first. So in order to find that first, I guess we'll have to use a system. But we could find the tension first, right? And then we could solve for the mass. It doesn't really matter. So I guess we'll use the system to solve for this. Okay, so um, system sum of the forces that equals um, m total times acceleration. So that's m1 plus um, m2 times our acceleration. So um, fg2 minus fg1, that equals m1 plus m2 times our acceleration. So what is, uh, we can say fg is mg, right? So m, m2g minus m1g, and that is equal to mass 1 plus mass uh, 2 times our acceleration. So from here, we can common factor. Well, no, we're not going to common factor. We're going to foil this acceleration into this equation. So m2g minus m1g is equal to our acceleration times m1 plus our acceleration times m2. And remember, we're solving for m2. We have everything but um, m2. We have our g, we have our m1, and we have the acceleration. So let's say m2g minus acceleration times m2, right? We brought this to the left. So that is equal to acceleration times m1 plus m1g. You bring the m1g to the right. Okay, so we can common factor an m2. So m2, and now we have g minus a. And that is equal to, well, we can common factor a m1, right? So m1 and that is a plus g so from here we just got to solve for m2 so divide both sides by g minus a so m2 is equal to m1 times a plus g all over g minus a notice remember i'm not using vectors for g so um mass 2 is equal to our mass 1 is 5.2 uh, kg so 5.2 kg times our acceleration, which is 4.6 meters per second squared. And we add that to our gravitational acceleration all over 9.8 meters per second squared minus 4.6 meters per second squared. And you should get an M2 of approximately 14.4 um, kilograms. So we already solved part one of the question, right? What is the mass of the second object? Now we just need to find the uh, tension in the rope. Okay, so let's make this a little smaller. Okay, so find the tension in the rope. We can use, um, well, we can use either mass one or mass two now because we have mass two, but let's just use mass one, right? Because that's a 100% given value. What like if me, imagine we made a mistake for mass two, we'd get mass, we'd get the tensional force for this wrong, right? So it's always good to use what we have, what we're given. So um, using mass one, so the sum of the forces that equals um, mass one times our acceleration, um, F T minus F 
g1 that equals m1 times acceleration right we're subtracting because we know this g is negative and this t is positive so um f t is equal to uh m1 a so mass one times acceleration plus we know f g1 is equal to m1 g and from there we can say f t is equal to well we common factor of mass one so mass one and we have a plus g and now we just plug in our values right so our tensional force is equal to mass one being 5.2 kilograms times our acceleration that being 4.6 meters per second squared plus our acceleration due to gravity therefore our tensional force should be around 74.88 newtons and notice how it's positive because our tensional force here is positive so we could have solved using mass 2 and we would have got a tensional force that is same in magnitude opposite direction as long as we did this whole step right right so yeah that's question 20. okay uh 21 this is the last question on the Apple machine section and uh, this is pretty similar to the previous question right so a Apple machine the smaller mass is 45 kg, so this is M1, and this is uh, 45 kg. Uh, we are given the tension in the rope, that is 512 newtons, so 512 newtons. And remember, the tension is the same all throughout the rope, just opposite directions, right, from the uh, connected at mass uh, unit. Um, it wants us to find the second mass and the acceleration. Okay, so... Um, I think it's easier to find the acceleration first, and we can do that using mass one, and then we can solve for the second mass. Now, there's a variety of ways to solve these questions. If you want on your own time, you can try using a different method and see how it all comes together. So using M1, so the sum of the forces, that equals um, mass one times our acceleration. Uh, we have um, Ft minus Fg. Right? And that equals mass 1 times our acceleration. Remember, Ft is positive and Fg is negative. So that's why we subtract the Fg from the Ft. So Ft minus uh, M1g, that is equal to M1a. And from here, we can isolate for a, right? So acceleration is equal to Ft minus M1g divided by M1. Right, we divide both sides by m1. So let's plug in our values. So we are given the Ft, that being 5, uh, 12 newtons. So 5, 12 newtons minus m1 being 45 kg times uh, 9.8 meters per second squared all over m1. So 45 kg. And our acceleration should equal approximately 1.6 meters per second squared. All right, so that's part two of the question we answered. What is the acceleration object? Now let's answer part one. Okay, uh, we can solve uh, for the mass two using, well, the mass two. Or we can use the system, but I think it's more convenient to use mass two. Okay, so the sum of the forces, that is equal to m2 times uh, acceleration. So what forces do we have acting on M2? Well, we have Fg2 minus Ft, right? This time, force of tension is negative and the gravity is positive. So that is equal to uh, mass 2 times your acceleration. So M2g minus Ft, that is equal to mass 2 times our acceleration. And we want to isolate for uh, M2. So in order to do that, we're going to have to uh, bring this m2 to the left so subtract minus m2a and bring the ft to the right so that equals positive ft so now we can common factor a m2 so m2 and we have g minus a and that is equal to our force of tension so from here we just divide both sides by uh g minus a right so m m2 that equals our force of tension divided by g minus a so m2 equals 512 newtons so 512 newtons over g so that being 9.8 meters per second squared right minus the acceleration 
uh, which we found in the previous question. So 1.6 meters per second squared. So if you put that in your calculators, you should get a value for M2 of 62.3 kg. And right, that makes sense because M2 is the heavier object and um, it is heavier than M1. So it being 62.3 kg, that's a pretty reasonable value. So yeah, that's it for uh, our machines. Let's head on to part five of this review. All right, we are in part six of the physics units one to three review. Uh, this will be about Fletcher's trolleys, which are essentially an extension of the Atwood machine type problems. So a Fletcher's trolley is essentially just an Atwood machine, but instead of having the masses dangling both um, in the air, one of the masses will be suspended in the air, while the other of the masses will be on a platform with the mass suspended in the air uh, accelerating this uh, other mass, right? So the greater this mass is, the faster this is going to go. So uh, yeah, let's get started. A Fletcher's trolley apparatus consists of a 1.9 kg cart. So let's say this is 1.9 kg. Um, it is on a level track uh, and is attached to a light string passing over a pulley and holding a 0.5 kg mass, so 0.5 kg. Um, and this mass is suspended in the air. Okay, so neglecting friction, so there's no friction. Uh, we want to find the tension in the string when the suspended mass is released. And part B wants us to find the acceleration in the trolley. So once again, Step one is to draw our free body diagrams. So free body diagrams and let's draw one for the system. So these are gonna be a little different than those of the uh, Atwood machines. So for the system, well, we have, right? We have mass one plus mass two. However, what is the force that is pulling these two masses together? Like if we consider these as one, so we're gonna extend the string. So move the string up and we extend it, right? So if we consider them as one system, uh, what is the force that is, um, that is acting on the system? Well, there's no friction, so we don't write a force of friction. However, there is an FG, but it's, this FG is not gonna be acting on the system. The only force that's acting on this entire system as one is the FG of this mass. So let's call this mass, uh, let's say this is mass two and this is mass one. So the only force acting on these two as one is FG two. So we'll write uh, FG two. So that is the force acting on the two masses as a system. Okay, so now let's draw a free body diagram of mass one. So mass one, so for mass one, we have a couple of forces acting on it, right? So we have our tensional force, right? This tensional force. So we're gonna write uh, FT. And let me just show you what we're doing with these two masses visually. We're essentially just taking them apart like this, right? We're, we're imagining that we are holding the two masses together in a horizontal uh, line, right? So with clockwise being like positive, well, for this scenario, it's a little hard to visualize that, but just imagine we stretch these two uh, masses out in a horizontal line. So um, for mass one, we have our force of tension that is acting in the positive direction. And then we have a normal force, right? We have our normal force, so that is this force, and we have our force of gravity, which is acting down here. So I guess we can say this is M1G or FG1, so FG1, and that's just going to be negative, right? So now we have our mass 2. So for mass 2, we have our force of gravity two, right? And that's gonna be positive. 
And then we have our tensional force, which is the same magnitude, just opposite direction. So that is a uh, negative. So part one wants us to find the um, tension in the string when released, and part B wants us to find the acceleration. So this question has a flaw in it, right? In order to find this tension, we need to find the acceleration first. There is no other way to find the tension. So um, if you see this question, remember we have to solve part B before we can do part A. It's just a little flaw they made in the book. Okay, so how are we going to find the, um, the acceleration? Well, we can use our system, right? So let's make everything a little smaller. So we're going to use our system to solve for the acceleration. So sum of the forces, that is equal to mass total times our acceleration. So mass 1 plus mass 2 times our uh, acceleration. And uh, we know that the only force acting on the system is Fg2, right? So we can say Fg2 is equal to mass 1 plus mass 2 times our uh, acceleration. So from here, we have F m 2 g and that is equal to mass 1 plus mass 2 times our acceleration. And we can just isolate for A, right? Our acceleration is equal to um, mass 2 times G all over mass 1 plus mass 2. So acceleration is equal to mass 2 being uh, 0.5 kg. Acceleration due to gravity, so 9.8 all over um, mass 1, so 1.9 kg plus mass 2, 0 0.5 kg. So you put that into your calculators and you should get an acceleration of approximately 2.04 uh, meters per second squared. Okay, so this is part B, right? But once I said um, you have to solve part B before we can solve part A, right? So now let's solve part A. Find the tension in the string when the suspended mass is released. Okay, so we can use either um, mass 1 or mass 2. However, it's a lot easier to, to use mass 1, right? Because there's only one force acting in the horizontal direction, whereas in mass 2, there's 2. So um, the sum of the forces, that is equal to uh, mass 1 times our acceleration. And for mass 1, the only force acting on this is Ft. So that is equal to um, mass 1 times our acceleration. So Ft is equal to mass 1 being uh, 1.9 kg. And our acceleration, which we just found, 2.04 meters per second squared. It's as simple as that. So put that into your calculators, and you should get 3.88 newtons. You can solve it using M2 and you'd get negative 3.88 newtons because the force of tension is opposite in direction. And, but it would take a little longer, right? Because there's uh, two forces acting in the horizontal direction. But yeah, that's pretty much it. Okay, let's move on to question 25. All right, uh, question 25. This is the last question on Fletcher's trolley. So a 40 gram glider is on an air track, right? So it's in the air, it's not really touching the surface. Um, so this is uh, 40 grams, so that is 0 0.4 kg. Um, it is connected to a mass, uh, 25 gram mass, so that is, sorry, this is 0 0.04 kg, and this is 0 0.025 kg kilograms. Um, it is connected by a 25 gram mass by a string passing over a frictionless pulley. So we're saying this pulley is frictionless, right? And for the majority of Fletcher's trolley questions, right, the, uh, the pulley will be frictionless until you get to higher level physics, right? Because for now, it's pretty much negligible. So um, how long will it take the glider to travel 0 0.85 meters? So this whole track to the other end of the track. So this is 0 0.85 five meters and we want to know how long it will take this glider to travel that 0 0.85 meters so we assume that the mass has not hit the floor so yeah it's not going to hit the floor and we also assume that um 
the, oh, sorry, it's talking about this mass. It's saying assume that this mass has not hit the floor. So we're assuming that this, during this um, uh, acceleration of our uh, glider, we're assuming that this mass does not touch the floor. Thus, why this is so long, right? It's not going to touch the floor by the time this guy gets to here. And yeah, that's pretty much it. So we want to find the time it takes for our glider to travel uh, 85 centimeters or 0.85 meters. How are we going to do that? Well, using our kinematic equations. So displacement, that is equal to 0.85 meters. Acceleration, well, we don't have acceleration, but we're going to find our acceleration. Uh, our V2, it does not give us our V2, and there's no way to find V2, so put an X on that. Um, our V1, that is 0 meters per second. We start from rest. And our time, that's what we are looking for. Okay, so uh, once again, the first thing we're gonna do is draw our free body diagrams. So let's make this all a little smaller so we have space. Okay, so um, let's draw a free body diagram for the system. So FBD. System. So in our system, the only force acting on it, there's no friction, right? It's on an air track. So uh, the only force acting on it is our FG2, given that this is mass two and this is mass one. So now let's draw our free body diagram for mass one. So the only difference between this one and the last question is, well, we're still gonna have the force of tension, right? But this time there's no normal force because this is not touching the ground. So we only draw our force of gravity. However, for this question, it's pretty much useless, right? We don't really care about the vertical components of our um, masses. And now let's do one for M2. So M2, and have that same force of tension, just opposite direction. So FT, and let's label this negative and this guy positive and we're gonna have a our fg2 so force of gravity 2 and that guy is positive okay so we want to find the uh, acceleration so we can get that using the system right we don't this was pretty much useless it's just there i just did this so you understand what the question looks like visually so uh, some of the forces that is equal to mass one plus mass two times our acceleration, right? This is for the system. Uh, we only have one force acting on this. So FG two is equal to mass one plus mass two times our acceleration. FG two is the same thing as M two G. So that is equal to uh, mass one plus mass two times our acceleration. Note that G, we don't put a vector sign, and this G is positive, so just write a positive sign there. And yeah, now we just isolate for acceleration. So acceleration is equal to uh, M1, sorry, M2G over M1 plus M2. Therefore, if we plug that into our calculators, we will get an acceleration of 3.76 meters per second squared, approximately. Remember, we just plug in mass two, that being 0 0.04 kg, our gravity being uh, 9.8 meters per second squared, our M1 and our M2. However, I'm not gonna use this. I only showed you this so like you know that the acceleration is 3.76 meters per second squared. So. In physics, we want to simplify things as much as possible. We want to get the most exact numbers. And in order to get these most exact numbers, we don't put the numbers until the very end. So what do I mean by that? I'll show you. So we have our acceleration. And we're going to plug this acceleration as m2g over m1 plus m2. So that is our acceleration. Let me just make this a little bit more clear m2g so now 
we're gonna solve for our time using our kinematic equations. And which kinematic equation we're gonna use? Well, we're gonna use number three, right? So um, our displacement is equal to our initial velocity times our change in time plus uh, one half times our acceleration times the time squared. Um, the initial velocity is zero meters per second, so we can cross this whole part out. And now we're left with our displacement is equal to one half times our acceleration times our change in time squared. Okay, so we want to isolate for the time. So how are we gonna do that? Well, let's first divide both sides by one over two. So that's the same thing as multiplying this by two, right? So uh, two times our displacement is equal to a times delta t squared. Divide both sides by a. So delta t squared is equal to two times our displacement over the acceleration and now square root both sides. So let's move this up here. So delta t is equal to the root of two times our displacement over our acceleration. And from here, we're gonna plug in all our values, right? So our acceleration we said is m2g over m1 plus m2. Or you can use this value, right? But you're not going to get the most exact uh, answer. So now we can plug in all our values, right? This will be the most exact answer that you can get. So 2 times our displacement being 0 0.85 meters all over, so bracket, M2, that is um, 0 0.04 kg. So 0 0.0 sorry, 0 0.025 kg, 0 0.025 kg times the gravity, so 9.8 meters per second squared, all over M1 plus M2, so M1 is 0 0.04, 0 0.04 kg plus 0 0.025 kg, um, and we're going to put a full bracket over here, and a full bracket over here. So uh, our change in time is equal to, so plug that all into your uh, calculators and you should get 0 0.67 seconds and approximately, right? So yeah, that's how long you will take for this glider to reach the other end of the track. And we're pretty much done. So we can move on to part six of the review. Okay, so this is part six on the physics uh, review. We'll be talking about incline and decline planes. So what is an incline plane or a decline plane? So we have some plane, right? And it's at an incline. So here's our plane, it's at an incline. And we have some angle, and some angle theta. We're gonna have some mass, right? Let's put the mass over here. And we wanna know what forces are acting on this mass, given that the mass is uh, going down, right? It's falling. So we have the normal force, right? This is our normal force. It's always perpendicular to the surface. So this is our surface, it's perpendicular. Um, we have a force of gravity. However, the force of gravity is not here. The force of gravity is always acting downwards, right? So the force of gravity would be here. This is our uh, FG we can label. So FG. So now that we found our force of gravity, uh, we can find our vector components of our gravity, right? So what is the force um, making this object um, fall or uh, go down this inclined plane? What's our force of gravity in the x direction? So where do we get that from? Well, here in purple, I'm gonna draw a y component of our fg. So this is f g y. And let's draw another vector. This is our x component. So f 
g x so basically these our are our vector components of our gravity and remember this is a 90 degree angle so now that we have all that we can say that um the force that is making this object go down the plane is our force of gravity in the x direction so this is our f g x right we just move this f g x up here it means the exact same thing we can split our vector f g into its vector components f g x and f g y so what is f g x well if we use this triangle that we just made right so we have um our f g as our hypotenuse so f g and we have our f g y and this is um f g x so where is theta where is the angle well if we extend this down right let's extend this f g we form a right angle and that right angle is over here so this so for the case of this question right uh theta is 15 degrees it's 15 degrees so we know that uh this angle over here is 180 minus 90 minus 15. so 180 minus 90 minus 15 and that gives us an angle of uh 75 degrees so this angle here is 75 degrees this is 15 degrees so if this is 15 degrees and this is 75 degrees this angle over here this angle right here is complementary right so uh we can this angle over here is 90 minus 75 so 90 minus 75 and we get uh 15 degrees so this is 15 degrees and look at that our angle over here is the same as our angle over here so um, we can say that this is theta. This is 15 degrees in this case, right? But for now, I'm not going to plug in that 15. So if this is theta, then what is uh, FGX? Well, we can say, well, we have, what do we have for sure? We know our FG, right? So we have, if you want to find FGX, this is our opposite, and this is our hypotenuse. So our trig ratio do we use? We use sine theta, right? So sine theta equals our opposite, so f g x over our adjacent, over our hypotenuse, sorry, f g. So f g x is equal to f g sine theta. Similarly, we can say that um, for f g y, we have the adjacent and the hypotenuse, so we use the cos trig ratio. So cos theta is equal to our adjacent being uh, fgy over our hypotenuse, fg. So fgy equals fg cos theta. So these are just the derivations for these two formulas. You're not going to have to prove this every single time, right? If you want, you can just memorize these two formulas and plug them in, but here's just a little proof of where they come from, why it works. So now that I have that out of the way, we can start the actual question. So let me just erase all of this. Okay, so we have a car parked at the top of the hill, so an inclined plane. Remember, it doesn't matter how you draw your inclined plane, whether it is uh, left-facing or right-facing. As long as you properly label your um, directions. So that is a very important part of inclined planes, the positive and negative directions or your X and Y um, directions. So I like to draw my inclined planes this way. However, it really does not matter at the end of the day which way you draw it. So we have our um, car parked. I'm going to put it near the top, right? Even though it's parked at the top. And the forces acting on this car, well, we said there's um, FGX over here. We have FGY here is um, our regular force of gravity, right? 
and it's saying we are neglecting friction. Okay, so let's draw a set of axes so we know what our positive and our negative directions are. So let um, so let this be our x direction, right? Where uh, to the right is positive and to the left is negative, and this be our y direction, right? So to the top is positive and to the bottom is negative. So um, this is our x. So let's draw that in white. And this is our y. So um, now we want to find how fast will it be going, how fast will this car be going when it reaches the bottom of the hill. Okay, so we're gonna have to be, use our uh, kinematics. Oh, and one more thing, I forgot to draw the normal force. Although for this question, the vertical components are pretty much useless. So, um, let me just write over here. So, Fgx equals um, Fg cos theta and Fgy equals Fg Sorry, fgx equals fg sine theta, and fgy equals fg cos theta. Okay, so uh, we want to find how fast it's going when it reaches the bottom of the hill. So we have our displacement, our acceleration, v2, v1, and delta t. So acceleration, we can find that. We're going to have to find that. Uh, we want to find the fi the final velocity is our end goal. So let's put a question mark. Um, the displacement is 42 meters. So uh, this hill, right, it's 42 meters. Um, V1, so we start from rest because we're parked at the top of the hill. So V1 equals uh, 0 meters per second. And we don't care about the time. So that's we're going to use equation number 5. Okay, so before we can do all that, we have to find our acceleration. So um, sum of the forces in the x direction, this direction, or you could say sum of the forces in the uh, parallel direction. So in the parallel direction, because this is parallel to the uh, plane. So I, I just like to use some of the forces in the x direction as it looks nicer to me and it makes more sense so that is equal to um mass times acceleration ma okay so there is no friction so we only have one force acting in the x direction and that is fgx so that is equal to m times acceleration where fgx is equal to uh fg sine theta so that is equal to mass times acceleration so that is equal to mg uh, sine theta. So that is equal to mass times uh, acceleration. And from here, we have to solve for uh, acceleration. So acceleration is equal to uh, mg sine theta over the mass, right? Divide both sides by m. And look at that. You'll notice that the mass is pretty much useless. We don't really need this mass, right? We can cancel out the masses. And we're left with a simple um, formula for A. So our acceleration is equal to G sine theta. So if you remember your conservation of energy uh, unit, you can cancel out the masses, right? A has no effect. No matter how big the mass is, you're still going to get the same acceleration. So uh, from there, I could solve for A, right? But if you remember from the previous questions, I said that we want to make this um, answer as exact as possible or as simplified as possible. So we're gonna plug this A as uh, G sine theta. I notice that I'm using the vector, so we're gonna have to use negative 9.8, right? Because uh, this G is negative. So um, from here, we use kinematic equation number uh, five. So that is V2 squared is equal to V1 squared plus two times our acceleration times our displacement. 
we can cross out our uh, v1 because it is zero. So uh, v2 squared equals two times the acceleration times the displacement. Uh, to isolate for uh, v2, all we gotta do is square root, right? So v2 is equal to the root of two times the acceleration times the dis displacement. And let's go over here. So v2 is equal to the root of two times g sine theta times our displacement. Okay, so plug in those values. So two times negative 9.8 meters per second square um, times sine of the angle. So theta is 15 degrees, so equals 15 degrees. So sine of 15 degrees. And here's a little trick, right? If you did multiply that by a positive displacement, you'd get a uh, undefined answer, right? You can you would have a negative times a positive, and you'd square root that negative to get a undefined answer. So if you look at this question, right? Look at the diagram. Where is the car going? Well, we defined this as positive x and negative x. The car is going down this way. So our displacement is negative forty-two meters, right? So we can say uh, sine 15 times negative 42 meters. You put that into your calculators and your final velocity should end up being around 15 meters per second. So that is a typical uh, inclined plane question, right? Where you have to solve for um, the final velocity that a object reaches when it uh, reaches the bottom of the inclined plane. So yeah, let's head on to the next question. Question 27. So starting from rest, a cyclist coasts down the starting uh, ramp of a professional biking track. If the ramp has a minimum legal dimensions of 1.5 meters high, so 1.5 meters high and 12 meters long, find the acceleration of the cyclist, ignoring friction. Okay, so part A wants us to ignore friction. So I labeled all our forces acting on this, right? without friction. So uh, we want to find the acceleration. So sum of the forces in the x direction, that equals mass times acceleration. The only force acting in this x direction without friction is um, fgx. So that is equal to our mass times our acceleration, where fgx is um, mg sine theta. You can say this is negative mg sine theta, right? Because we're not including the vector signs. So that is equal to mass times acceleration and negative because this is the negative and this is the positive direction. Okay, uh, what do we have? Well, we have our mass, we have our gravity, we have our other mass. So we can cancel uh, these masses out, right? So negative g sine theta equals our um, acceleration. Okay, so we have our gravity and we're missing our theta. So how are we gonna get theta? Well, we use our tan trig ratio, right? Uh, opposite and adjacent. So tan theta, tan theta equals opposite, that being 1.5 meters over adjacent being 12 meters. So theta is equal to the inverse tan of that ratio. So our angle is approximately 7.13 uh, degrees. Okay, so we can plug that back into here. So negative g times, so now we can plug in, plug in our values. So negative 9.8 meters per second squared times sine of 7.13. And that is equal to our acceleration. So uh, put that into your calculators and you get a value of negative 1.2 meters per second squared, right? And it makes sense that our acceleration is negative given that we are uh, speeding up in the negative direction. So that is part A. Let's move on to part B. Okay, part B. 
So um, now we want to find the acceleration. However, this time we are including friction. So we're including this frictional force. So I guess we should draw it a little smaller than our FG uh, X. So this is our force of friction. Um, now we just use our same equation. So some of the forces in the X direction that equals mass times acceleration. What forces do we have? Well, this time we have FGX and we have our force of friction. So we can say force of friction minus FGX and that is equal to MA. So our force of friction minus MG sine theta, that is equal to mass times acceleration. So we have our G, we have our theta, but we're missing our force of friction, right? We don't need the masses, right? We're gonna be able to cancel them out, but for now we cannot cancel them out, right? You cannot divide this by an M and cancel this out. That is not allowed. So we gotta find our force of friction and how are we gonna find that? Well, we're given mu, so we can say force of friction equals mu Fn. And what is the normal force? Well, because we're given this and we need the normal force to find friction, right? So the normal force, okay, so the normal force, right? Now we look at the y direction. So some of the forces in the y direction equals zero. This being the y direction or the perpendicular direction. We can also say some of the forces in the perpendicular direction. So perpendicular to the plane. So that is equal to zero, right? So there's no motion in the vertical direction. So um, that is Fn minus Fgy. So that is equal to zero. Therefore, our normal force is equal to uh, Fgy. Therefore, our normal force, well, we said Fgy is mg cos theta. So that is our normal force. Okay, so now we can plug in our normal force. So force of friction that equals mu, so mu times mg uh, cos theta. And notice that we cannot solve for the force of friction yet, right? Why? Well, because we're not given m. So you may be thinking that uh, we won't be able to solve this, but we can still solve for acceleration, right? We don't need the m. We can cancel that out. So let's plug this force of friction back into here. So mu times mg cos theta minus mg sine theta, and that is equal to our mass times our acceleration. So how are we gonna cancel these masses out, right? We're gonna have to common factor an m. And while we're at it, we can also common factor a g. So mg, uh, common factor, right? So that is equal to mu, well, not equal to, that's just common factor. So mg cos uh, theta, mu cos theta minus sine theta. And that is equal to mass times acceleration. So now we're allowed to divide both sides by m and cancel these m's out. So let's cancel these m's. Therefore, our acceleration is equal to g times uh, mu cos theta minus sine theta, right? So now we can plug in our values for um, g and uh, mu and cos and their angle, right? So acceleration is equal to 9.8 meters per second squared times mu, so that is 0.11 times cos theta. Well, we know our angle is 7.13 from the previous question. So I should put that here, so 7.13 degrees uh, minus sine of 7.13 degrees. And you should get an acceleration that approximate to negative uh, 0.146 meters per second squared. All right, part C. All right, part C. So C wants us to find the time taken to reach the bottom of the ramp if friction acts as it does in part B. So that is including friction, right? So we're gonna have to use our acceleration that we got from part B. So uh, the time taken to reach the bottom of the ramp. Okay, 
So we have our displacement and well, we don't have our displacement, but we're gonna find the displacement, right? A squared plus B squared equals C squared. So um, 12 squared plus 1.5 squared equals uh, C squared. So our hypotenuse, or that being our displacement, is equal to root 12 squared plus 1.5 squared. So our hypotenuse, so root 12 squared plus 1.5 squared, is pretty much 12.09. We can round that back to 12 if we wanted to, or we can say 12.1. It's not really gonna make that much of a difference in this type of uh, question, but in a different type of question, it may uh, make some somewhat of a difference. So uh, we can say that our displacement is negative 12.1 meters, right? This is the negative direction. So there's our, our displacement, our acceleration. Well, we have that, that is negative 0 0.146 meters per second squared. Uh, our uh, final velocity. So that is the equation we're gonna use. We're gonna use equation number three because we don't need that. Uh, our initial velocity. So the cyclist starts from rest. So that is equal to zero meters per second. And our time, that is what we want to find. All right, so let's use the uh, third kinematic equation. So let's do it over here. So our displacement equals our initial velocity times our time plus one half times the acceleration times the time change in time squared. All right, so we know our initial velocity is zero, right? So we can cancel that this out. Therefore, our our displacement is equal to one half a delta t squared. We want to isolate for t, so we can multiply this by two, right? Because you're dividing by a half. That's the same thing as multiplying by two. And we can divide this by acceleration. And then we can square root both sides to get a simplified equation for time being um, root two times displacement all over the acceleration. So our change in time is equal to the root of two times negative 12.1 meters all over negative 0 0.146 meters per second squared. Therefore, our change in time, so root two times negative 12.1 all over negative 0.146 and we get a time or a change in time of um 12.87 seconds so it takes uh 12.87 seconds for this biker to reach the bottom of this um 12.1 meter ramp right Okay, question 28. A skiers coast down a 3.5 degree slope at a constant speed. Okay, so we're, now we know we're gonna have to use a, the first law. So they want us to find the coefficient of kinetic friction between the skis and the snow covering the slope. Okay, so I drew all our forces except the force of friction. So let me just draw that in right now. So given that we are traveling at constant velocity or constant speed, our force of friction vector should be the same magnitude, just opposite in direction of our um, x direction of our gravity vector. So this is our force of friction. Okay, so they want us to find the coefficient of kinetic friction. So where do we get that from? Well, we know this formula, right? Force of friction is equal to mu fn. We isolate from mu our coefficient of friction being mu is equal to our force of friction over our normal force. Okay, so we need to find the force of friction and the normal force. So let's do the easier one first. So that being the normal force. So um, the normal force, so Fn, well, let's say the sum of the forces in the y direction that is equal to zero. So that's where we're gonna get the normal force, this y direction. So Fn minus Fgy, right? We subtract this negative m 
no vector sign, right? We're just subtracting this f g y, and that is equal to zero. So f n minus uh, m g cos theta equals zero, and f n equals m g cos theta. So we can say, so far what we got is mu is equal to force of friction over m g cos theta. And notice that um, we're not given the mass. So even if you wanted to find the force of, of a normal force from here, you couldn't. So how are we gonna find mu? Well, we're gonna have to find some equation for our force of friction that includes the mass, and then we can cancel these masses out, and then we'll have everything we need to solve for mu. So let me show you what I mean by that. Okay, so um, to find the, uh, the force of friction, we say some of the forces in the x direction. So we know we're going at constant velocity, right? Uh, constant speed. So the sum of the forces in the x direction equals zero. What forces do we have acting in this direction? Well, we have our force of friction, which is positive. That's why I put on the left side, minus our FGX, our force of gravity in the x direction. So that equals zero. So our force of friction uh, minus mg sine theta equals zero. Therefore, our force of friction equals mg sine theta. Okay, so now we have an expression for our force of friction. And from here, I think you guys can see what we're gonna do. So uh, let's bring this down here. So our coefficient of friction or mu, that is equal to, we plug this in for force of friction. So mg sine theta over mg cos theta, right? And look at that our coefficient of friction simplifies to, well, we can cancel out not only the m's, but we can also cancel out the g's. So our coefficient of friction simplifies to sine theta over cos theta. And from here, you can plug in your values or you can simplify it even more, right? So our force of friction equals, well, we know this um, trig ratio or trig identity of sine over cosine. Well, that is just tan theta. So that's as simple as we can get this equation. And from here, we just plug in tan theta. So tan of 3.5 degrees. So tan of 3.5, and we get a coefficient of friction of 0 0.061. So look at that, we were able to simplify this entire question all the way down to tan theta. It's that easy. So that is why we use these shortcuts in physics, right? We wanna get um, the most simplified equation as possible so that we don't have to do all this work and all these steps in between. Okay, so question 29 is gonna be a little different than the previous questions. So instead of working with uh, declined planes, we'll be working with inclined planes. So uh, in terms of this question, right, we flick a 5.5 gram coin up a smooth board. So it's going this way, right? We're moving in the positive x direction instead of previously moving in the negative x direction. So if the initial velocity of the coin is 2.3 meters per second up the board and the coefficient of co uh, friction is 0.40, how far does the coin? Okay, so we're gonna have to use our kinematic equation. So our displacement, that's what we want to find. Our uh, acceleration, we're gonna find that using our F net equation, our final velocity. Well, it says how far will it travel before stopping. So when it stops, it's zero meters per second. Our initial velocity, well, we're given an initial velocity. So that is 2.3. And the time, which we don't have and we don't care about. So we're going to use uh, kinematic equation number five. Okay, so the trick or hard part of this question is identifying the... Uh, vectors or the forces acting on this coin. So we flick a 5.5 gram coin up a smooth board. So you may be inclined to draw a force applied. But if you remember from the grade 11 review, there's a reason why we don't draw a force applied, right? The coin has already been flicked. It has an initial speed. It's already moving. So there's no applied force. The applied force has already been applied. Therefore, 
there is no force that is pushing on this coin no more, right? It's already been applied. So the only forces acting on this coin now are, are um, F, G, X, and our force of friction. So remember from the previous question, our force of friction was over here. But since we're moving in the positive x direction, our force of friction is going to be in the negative x direction, right? The uh, force of friction is always um, in the opposite direction of motion. So if the direction of motion is the positive x direction, then our force of friction is in the negative dire x direction. Remember, considering that this is positive and this is negative, it all depends how you draw your plane. If you draw it this way, it's the opposite. If you define this as positive and this is negative, then it's the opposite, right? But we're defining this as positive and this is negative. Okay, so um, step one, I guess, find the acceleration. So I guess we can finish this free body diagram, right? So we have our normal force, our FGY, and our regular gravity, so FG. Okay, so sum of the forces in the x direction, that equals... Um, mass times acceleration what forces do we have acting on this x direction well we have a negative f g x right because it's in the negative direction and we also have a negative force of friction and that is equal to mass times acceleration you can also write this as um f g x with the vector sign plus the force of friction with the vector sign however then you're gonna have to remember that you have to, pl to plug a negative here and a negative here and I feel like it's easier to not use the vector signs and just keep the negative signs over here so we don't have to remember at the end of the equation or halfway through the equation to add the negative signs. But at the end of the day, it's what is easier for you. Okay, so we can uh, simplify this more. So negative uh, mg sine theta minus the force of friction and that is equal to mass times acceleration. Um, well, we're given M, we're given G, we're given the angle, and we're given this M as well, right? It's the same as this M. So, um, what we can define is the force of friction in order to solve for acceleration. We can get that from our mu of N equation. So, mu of N, we're given mu, and we know that Fn, so sum of the forces in the x direction, that equals zero. So, Fn uh, minus Fg cos theta, that equals zero. Therefore, our normal force is equal to um, Fg cos theta, or Mg cos theta. So that is our normal force, and we can plug it into here. So the force of friction equals mu times Mg cos theta. And I can solve for this force of friction. However, I don't like working with the masses because I want to cancel them out. And I like putting the calculations at the very end of the equation as it makes everything easier for me. Okay, so uh, negative mg sine theta minus mu mg cos theta, right? That comes from here. So that is equal to mass times acceleration. Uh, we can common factor out a negative mg. So we, we're left with sine theta. If you common factor your negative, this becomes positive. So plus mu um, cos theta, and that equals mass times acceleration. This is why I decided to keep the this form of the force of friction so that I would be able to cancel out the m's. So therefore, negative g times sine theta plus mu cos theta equals the acceleration. So I could plug this entire expression into here. However, I feel like that's a little too much, right? Maybe a little too much for your brains to see all that. So I'll just solve for the acceleration. So the acceleration is equal to nine, negative 9 9.8 meters per second squared times sine of 25 degrees plus the coefficient of friction, B 
being 0 0.40 times cos of 25 degrees. So put that into your calculator. So negative 9.8 times sine of 25 plus 0.4 times cos of 25. And we get an acceleration. So a acceleration of, okay, so we get an acceleration of negative 7.69 meters per second squared. Okay, so uh, that makes sense, right? We are slowing down in the positive direction. So it makes sense that our acceleration is negative. Okay, so from here, we can just plug that into our kinematics equations. So that is negative 7.69 meters per second squared. Let's simplify this equation. So uh, we're using equation number uh, five. So uh, V2 squared equals V1 squared plus two times the acceleration times the displacement. You can cancel out this V2 given that it's zero. Bring this V1 to the left. So negative V1 squared equals two times acceleration times the displacement. Divide both sides by two A and we're left with a displacement equaling um, negative v1 squared all over 2 times the acceleration. So plug our values in. So negative m in brackets, v1 being 2.3 squared all over 2 times the acceleration, which we said was negative 7.69 meters per second squared. And we're left with a displacement so it's of 0 0.34 meters or 34 uh, centimeters. Notice that the displacement is positive, right? Because we're going in the positive direction. And therefore, it takes, it, the coin go, travels uh, 34 centimeters or 0.34 meters before uh, stopping. All right, so this is uh, part seven of the physics units one to three review, and we'll be covering centripetal force. So what is centripetal force? So say we have some circle, right? And in the case of this question, a boy is twirling a ball on a string in a horizontal circle. So some boy, right? He's twirling a ball and it's going around and around and around, right? So, um, centripetal force comes from Latin and it is called centrum petire, I believe. And what it means is center seeking. So what forces are seeking the center of the circle? So if we look at this from a bird's eye view, right? So we're looking from the top. What forces are seeking the center? What forces are going towards the center? If there's a boy with a string and he's, he's twirling a ball in a circle, right? So the force that is um, attracting the center or center seeking, the center seeking force, that is our force of tension, right? That is our tensional force our center seeking force or our centripetal force. So um, what does the centripetal force do? Well, it keeps the ball from um, flying off this circular path, if that makes any sense, right? If it wasn't for this uh, centripetal force, the ball, wherever it was moving, right? So here are our like velocity vectors, right? So at each point we have our velocity vectors and these are tangent to the circle. So if the string were to break, the uh, centripetal force would would, uh, would break. And if the wherever the centripetal force breaks, that's where the ball would travel in a straight line or a tangent line to the circle. So say the uh, centripetal force were to break over here, the ball would travel in a straight line like this. That's the direction that the ball would travel. But because there is a centripetal force, it's keeping that ball from traveling like that, right? It's keeping the ball in this circular path, this circular uh, motion. 
And when we're working with centripetal force, we don't use vector signs, which is something that I do not like using. So that is a plus of this, um, this section. So let's get started with the question. Okay, so a boy is twirling a 0 0.15 kg, right? Turn that into kilograms. Uh, he's a uh, 1.55 kg ball on a 1.65 meter string in a horizontal surface. So the string will break if the tension reaches 208 newtons. What is the maximum speed at which the ball can move without breaking the string? Okay, so we have a force for, uh, we have a formula for this centripetal force and that is FC, meaning centripetal force, is equal to mv squared over r. So I can cover the der derivation of this formula in a separate video, but for the case of this review, it would be too time-consuming and would take too long. Okay, so what is this centripetal force? Well, as we covered in the um, short explanation of uh, centripetal force, we said that this force that's keeping the ball in its horizontal path is the force of tension. Remember, no vectors. So that is equal to mv squared over r, where m represents the mass, v is the velocity, and r is the um, radius. So they want us to find the maximum speed at which the ball can move without breaking the string. Okay, so it says that the string will break if the tension reaches 208 newtons. So we have our force of tension at which the string breaks. Um, we have the mass, and we're given the the length of the string, and you're probably wondering, well, are we going to have to use half of that length for the radius? Well, no. If you have a string, right, it's technically the radius of the circle, right? This is the circle, and we're giving the length of the string, that being 1.65 meters. So that length of the string, while you may think it think it's the diameter of the circle, it's technically the radius of the circle, right? So we're given the radius, the mass, and the tensional force, and we have to solve for velocity. So let's rearrange this equation. So we can bring the r to the left. So our force of tension times r is equal to mv squared. Um, therefore, our v squared is equal to the force of tension times r over the mass. And now we just square root both sides, so our velocity is equal to the root of FTR over the mass. So velocity equals root, we said the tensional force at the uh, breaking point of the string is 208 newtons times the radius, which is 1.65 meters all over the mass, which is 0 0.155 kilograms. Turn that into kg from grams, right? So put that into your calculators and you should get a value. Let's see, so root uh, 208 times 1.65 all over 0 0.165. And we get a velocity of 47 meters per second. So this uh, string will break when the tension reaches 208 newtons. So the maximum speed that this boy can twirl this string before the tensional force or the centripetal force breaks is 47 meters per second. That is the maximum speed that this boy can twirl this string around in a circle before the tensional force um, is gone. And if he goes any faster than that, right? So here's the, the boy, this is the string, this is our circle, right? If he goes any faster than that, right? The tensional or the, ten the rope will break and wherever the rope breaks, say it breaks over here, where's the ball gonna travel? Well, the ball's gonna travel in dire any direction tangent to the circle. So the ball is gonna travel in this direction and it's gonna fly off in that direction until it hits the ground, right? Unless we're working with uh, orbits, which we're gonna recover in the next section. 
um, the ball is gonna hit the ground. So yeah, that is an introduction to centripetal force. Let's move on to the next question. Okay, uh, question 16. An electron with the mass of 9.1 times 10 to the negative 31 kg orbits a hydrogen nucleus at a radius of 5.3 times 10 to the negative 11 meters at a speed of 2.2 times 10 to the 6 meters per second. Find the centripetal force acting on the electron and what type of force supplies this centripetal force. Okay, so our centripetal force equation, mv squared over r. Okay, so what is this force that is um, keeping this electron in orbit of the hydrogen nucleus? Well, if you've taken any chemistry courses, you would know that that is the electrostatic uh, attraction between the nucleus and the electrons. I'm not going to dive too deep into this, given that this is a physics course, but if you want, you can uh, research more about it on your own time. Okay, so um, I guess I should call this force attraction for electrostatic attraction, so F. E A, I'll just call it. Um, that is equal to m, so m being nine point one times ten to the negative thirty one kg times v, two point two times ten to the six meters per second, and don't forget to uh, square that all over um, the speed. All over the radius, sorry, being 5.3 times 10 to the negative 11 meters. And you get a force of, stripital force of 8.319 times 10 to negative 8 newtons. All right, um, question 18. You're driving a 16... 54 kg car on a level road surface and start to round a curve at 77 kilometers an hour. We have to change that in two meters per second, right? The radius of curvature is 129 meters. What must be the frictional force between the tires and the road so that you can safely make the turn? Okay, so let's picture what's going on, right? Okay, so we have some car that we're driving and it starts to go around this curve, right? So what's keeping this car from drifting off this way, right? Well, it's a force of friction. This force of friction is our centripetal force. It's the force acting towards the center. It's the force keeping the car from just sliding off, right? Drifting off into the tangent direction to the direction of the circle or the circle. So we can say our centripetal force, so Fc, is equal to the frictional force. If that makes any sense, right? Try to picture it. A car is curving around a circle. The force that's keeping that car from moving out of that circle is the frictional force. It's this frictional force that's keeping this car in this circular path, right? Okay, so now that we have that out of the way, we can solve this question. Okay, so Fc is equal to mv squared over r, and we want to find the frictional force, so the force of friction is equal to m, so 1654 uh, kg times the um, velocity, so 77 kilometers per hour. We know there is a one in one kilometer there is a thousand meters in one hour there is three thousand six hundred seconds we cancel out the kilometers and the hours and we're left with units of um meters per second so 77 times 1000 divided by 3600 and we're left with um 21.38 repeating meters per second or 389 right so 21.389 meters per second squared all over the uh, radius so that's 129 meters and that leaves us with a centripetal force that being our frictional force of 
Um, so one, six, five, four times the velocity squared all over 129. And we get a frictional force that is keeping this car from drifting off a circular path. This frictional force that's doing that is 5,865 newtons. Okay. Okay, question 19. This is pretty similar to the previous question. So a stunt driver for a movie needs to make a 25-45 kg cars begin to skid on a large flat parking lot surface. The force of friction between the, his tires and the concrete surface is 1.75 times 10 to the 4th newtons and he's driving at a speed of 24 meters per second so as he turns more and more sharply what radius of curvature will he reach when the car just begins to skid so what does that mean well here's our circle right the car is moving blah 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 and we want to find the uh, radius of curvature just when the car begins to get out of this circular path right so this is a bird's eye view right so when the car just begins to make a tangent the a tangent to the circle right its path that's what we want to find we want to find the radius so we want to find a radius that will make this circle sharp enough for the uh centripetal force to be cancelled out and the car to uh come out of this circular path right so we want to find the point just where that happens. So we do this using our same equations, right? So FC equals MV squared over R, where FC is our force of friction. And now we just isolate for R. So R FF is equal to MV squared. So our radius is equal to MV squared over the frictional force, that being a centripetal, centripetal force. So R is M being 25.45 times the uh, speed, 24 squared all over the frictional force. So 1.75 times 10 to the fourth newtons. Put that into your uh, calculators and you should approximately get 84 meters. So that is the uh, radius of curvature that the car will reach when the car just begins to skid, right? So that's how, so that's like the radius of curvature that the car must have in order to uh, get out of this circular path or just get out of this circular path. Okay, uh, that was question 19. All right, uh, question 21. So this question is gonna be a review of the incline and decline plane units, right? But we're gonna include centripetal force on top of that. So a car exits a highway on a ramp that is banked at a curve of 15 degrees to be horizontal. The exit of the ramp has a radius of curvature of 65 meters. If the conditions are extremely icy, and the driver cannot depend on any depend on any friction to help make the turn. At what speed should the driver travel so that the car will not skid off the ramp? So this is a new topic called banked curves, which is a combination of our uh, centripetal force and our incline incline plane knowledge, right? So over here, I have a visual diagram of a pretty common bank curve type of scenario, that being race car tracks, right? So if you remember the previous question, right? It said that um, at 24 meters per second, the car would begin to skid. So at 24 meters per second, this car would begin to skid. So how do we manage to build NASCAR tracks, right? Where these cars are traveling at 80, 85 meters per second, almost four times the speed. Well, we bank the curves, we make it banked. Instead of having a plane uh 2d 2d um plane we bank this curve so that these cars will not skid off that easily right these cars would have to be traveling over 100 meters per second in order to, to skid off so 
what is this force that's keeping it from um, skidding or from flying off the track? Well, it's not the frictional force. And remember, these, for these type of questions, we'll be uh, neglecting friction. So what is the force? So let's draw our inclined plane, right? So we have some inclined plane like this. Um, so there's our inclined plane, and this is our mass, right? So we have the normal force, right? The normal force is acting perpendicular to the plane. And what do we define centripetal force as again, right? We said that centripetal force is center seeking. So where is the center of this circle or this banked circle? Well, the center would be here, right? Maybe a little bit further, right? But I cannot extend this image anymore. So the center would be around here, maybe here. So that is the center. So what force is going to the center? Right? If this is the normal force and our frictional force, well we don't we're not using friction for this type of question, right? So what force is going towards this center point? Well that is the x component of our normal force, right? We have a y component of this normal force and the x component of the normal force. So that is the uh, force or our centripetal force acting on this car, keeping it from flying off the track. So by making a bank curve, we can make it so that these cars can travel a lot faster without skidding. Whereas if we were to do a regular circle, right? These cars wouldn't be able to travel nearly as fast as shown in the previous question, right? Where the car can only travel 24 meters per second before skidding off. So, um, how, what is f and x? So, we can say, because these are vectors, right? We can say this is f and y, and these are attached tip to tail, right? So f and y, let's make this a little shorter. This is f and x. Obviously, these are not to scale, right? But here is our angle, theta. So, we can derive this angle that we're going to use algebraically, or we can just use a visual uh, derivation, right? So if I have this plane, right, and I move it like that, it ends up looking like this. And this angle over here is the same as this angle over here, right? Just visualize moving this entire plane like that. So this angle over here is theta, right? So if we want to find our normal force in the x direction, we can say that our normal force, so the normal force in the x direction is, well, which trig ratio are we going to use to find that? Well, we can use fn or we can use fn y. And I believe it's easier to use f and y, and I'll show you why. <laughs> so we have opposite and adjacent. So tan theta is equal to the opposite being f and x over our adjacent. So that is f and y, the normal force in the y and the normal force in the x directions. So f and x is equal to f and y tan theta. And what is f and y? Well, what is this force acting here? This is, well, it's not fgy, right? fgy would be acting this way. This is just fg. So this force acting here, that's fg. So if we say the sum of the forces in the y direction, right, or equal to zero, then um, F and Y plus F G equals zero. Therefore, or we can say F and Y minus 
f g equals zero with no vector sign, right? So, because f g is in this negative direction and f n y is in the positive direction, so therefore, f n y equals m g, right? So we can derive our f n x or our centripetal force to equal m g tan theta. So that's the formula we're going to be using for um, the centripetal force of a bank curve. Remember, this is f n x, and it's center seeking a centripetal force centrum, right? Center and uh, centrum, which is seeking in Latin. So it is seeking the center. It is going to the center, and what is the radius then? Well, the radius is just this, right? This is our radius. It goes all the way to the center. And remember, the center is not from the bottom of the curve, right? We're going from the middle of this bank curve or where this x component of the normal force is acting all the way to the center, which is floating, right? It's in the middle of the air. So that is our um, centripetal force. Um, that is acting on a car on a bank curve. All right, so let's get started with the question. Okay, so now that we um, derived the uh, centripetal force of a bank curve, let's get started with the question. So um, let's draw our bank curve, right? So this will be our mass. We have our normal force, so Fn, and we have our vertical and our horizontal, so this is our horizontal components of the normal force, and our, this is mg, and we don't really care about any of the other forces acting on this, right? Friction is negligible, and we don't really need the y components of gravity or x components of gravity. And this is theta. And if you want, you can shift this normal vector to the right. So you can say it's like that. Let me just move this Fn up here. Fn. And this angle over here is theta, right? If you rotate this, that angle is theta. So um, they want us to find... Um, the speed that the driver the driver should travel so that the car will not skid off uh, the ramp. Okay, so we use our F C equals M V squared over um, R. So F C R equals M V squared, and V equals the root of uh, FCR over the mass. So what is um, FC? Well, we said the centripetal force, right? The centripetal force is the same as F, um, mg tan theta. So, um, so FC, that is equal to FNx, our centripetal force, and the centripetal force, F and X, is equal to M G tan theta. So, um, well, we're not given the mass, so we can't solve for F and X, right? So we're gonna have to plug this F and X into here, and you'll see something that we can do that's pretty cool. So if we plug in M G tan theta, times the radius all over m, we can cancel with the m's, right? We learned this from the inclined plane units because the conservation of energy laws, right? We're allowed to get rid of this m no matter how heavy this mass is, it won't affect our speed. So we end up with a very simple equation. So v is equal to g tan theta times the radius. That's an equation we can use whenever we want to find the velocity and we're given a bank curve 
although you should know how to derive it and where it comes from and how to get there, right? You don't want to just be blindly using these formulas. So let's plug in our values. So V equals the root of G. So G being 9.8, right? 9.8 meters per second squared times 10 of the angle. It says 15 degrees, so this angle is 15. So 10, 15 degrees, and um, the, okay, there's a radius of curvature of 65 meters. Remember, the radius of curvature is the same thing as the radius, right? So um, that is 65 meters. Therefore, our velocity ends up being, so root of 9.8 times 10, 15 times 65 and we get a velocity of approximately 13.06 meters per second. So yeah, that was the first bank curve question. Let's get to the next one. So say this was a uh, flat surface like that and it wasn't banked, the velocity required for this car to um, not get off the ramp would be a lot less. So by banking the curve, we can increase the uh, velocity required for the car uh, to travel so that it can will not uh, skid off the track okay uh, question 22 so this is pretty similar if not the exact same question as the previous one except uh, we're given different values so it asks us what speed uh, must a car travel to ensure that it does not leave the road so similar to the previous question it says what speed should the driver travel so that the car will not skid off the ramp so we derived an equation for this, V equals G tan theta times R, right? If you want to know where that comes from, just look at the previous question, right? So we're gonna use that formula. So our velocity equals the root of G tan theta times R. So V equals root 9.8 meters per second squared times 10 of the angle theta times the radius. So we have a radius of curvature of 175 meters. Remember, the radius of curvature is this radius, which is pretty much the same as our actual radius. If you, if you want to visualize how that works, you can draw a circle and maybe get a string and then curve it, right? Measure the string, curve it, and then measure the radius of that circle. And you'll notice that the radius of curvature will equal the radius of the circle. So that's why we use the radius of the circle of curvature into our, our expression. So uh, we square root that, therefore put that into your calculators, right? So root 9.8 times 10, 12 times 175. And we get a velocity of 9.1 meters per second so that is the speed that the travel must travel um, in order to ensure that he does not leave the road okay this is the last question in the bank curve section so an engineer must design a highway curve with a radius of curvature of 155 meters that can accommodate cars traveling at this speed at what angle should the curve be banked okay so this time we're looking for the angle so the formula that we derived in the previous questions will not work right that's for the velocity so we have to find the angle okay so what do we know about vectors well we have our x and y components but we could also place them tip to tail right so we can translate this f and y over here right placing it tip to tail and we know that the resultant is just from the tip of the first vector to the Sorry, from the tail of the first vector to the tip of the second vector. Okay, so we know that we can find our f and y and our f and x, right? So, where is theta? Well, we said theta is here, right? If you uh, rotate this um, triangle or plane uh, counterclockwise, you'll end up with your theta over here. So, we have our opposite and our adjacent. So, that's 10. So, we can say 10 theta equals our opposite, that being f and x over the adjacent f and y so our theta equals the inverse 10 of that ratio so f and x over f and y 
Okay, so let's find f and y first. So the sum of the forces in the y direction, or not the y direction, yeah, I guess we can say that's the y direc direction, that equals zero. So um, the sum of the forces, so we have f and y minus fg, which is also equal to mg. So that's equal to zero. And f and y equals mg. We already derived this in the previous uh, questions, but I just wanted to show you one more time in case you forgot. So now we have to find an expression for our normal force in the x direction. Well, we can't use the equation that we derived, that being f and x equals mg 10 theta. That won't work. Why? Well, because we don't have theta. We don't have, we don't have the angle. But what else do we know the normal force in the x direction is equal to? Well, we know that the f and x, or normal force in the x direction, that is also our uh, centripetal force. That is the force acting towards the center. And we have an equation for centripetal force, right? Fc equals mv squared over r. And we can say that f and x equals mv squared over r. Okay, now we have everything we need. We have the velocity, the radius, and we have our gravity. However, we're not given the mass, but once again, as we've done in the previous questions, all throughout this entire review, we, we know that we can cancel out the mass. So theta is equal to f and x. So we said f and x is mv squared over r. So, well, 10 inverse of mv squared over r. And we divide this by f and y, so all over mg, right? This is f and y is equal to mg. We could also write this as mv squared over r times the, recip times the reciprocal of f and y, so times 1 over mg. This just makes everything look a little neater and easier to visualize. So we can cancel out the m's, right? And we're left with theta equals 10 inverse of v squared over r times g. Okay, so now we pretty much have everything we need. Except one more thing, right? We have to turn this into meters per second. So 85 kilometers per hour, if you multiply that by 1,000 and divide by 3,600, you end up with 23.61 meters per second. So that is our velocity in meters per second. So over here, I'm gonna write theta equals 10 inverse of V squared. So 23.61 meters per second squared all over the radius, which is also the radius of curvature, that being 155 meters times our acceleration due to gravity. Okay, so put that into your calculators and you should end up with an angle of 20.1 degrees. So that is the angle that the curve must be banked so that this car can travel at this speed across a 155 uh, meter radius cur of curvature. So yeah, that's pretty much it for the bank curves. These are most, if not all of the type of questions that could show up, right? Solving for velocity, solving for our um, radius or solving for our angle. And yeah, let's move on to part eight of this review. Okay, this is part eight of the units one to three physics review, and we'll be covering the gravitational constant G and the universal law of gravitation formula. So what is G? Well, let's find out where G comes from. So from the start of your physics classes, right, you've been working with this simple formula, Fg equals mg. And that was used to calculate the force that Earth was applying on a mass, right? The weight, you could call it, the force of exertion of Earth onto a mass. And to the most extent, that was like pretty accurate, right? It would work almost all the time. However, the further you get away from Earth, the less accurate this formula works, right? This G value was calculated by Galileo in the surface of the Earth. He did not account for gravity changing the further you get from Earth, right? The pull that Earth has on you, or an object or a mass, decreases the further the mass gets away from Earth. So we came up with 
a, well, I didn't come up, we didn't come up with, some smart people came up with a propor proportionality, that being the force of gravity was proportional to the square of the masses. So we have two masses, right? We call the bigger one big M and the smaller one small M. And if they both happen to be the same mass, we just put the mass wherever, right? And it is inversely proportional to the square of R. So what is R? Well, R is the center to center distance between two masses. So say this is Earth and this is the sun. R is going to be the center to center distance. That being here to here, right? It's not this distance, right? That's the surface of the sun to the surface of the Earth's distance. We want the center to center distance, that being R. So that's what R is, right? And we can use this proportionality to say as the radius or sorry, as the center to center distance increases, the force of gravity will decrease between the two masses, right? As the masses increase, the force of gravity will increase, right? If you think about it, something like the Earth, our force of gravity is a lot greater than that of the sun or our acceleration due to gravity, right? Sorry, a lot greater than the moon, not the sun. Why? Well, because the mass is a lot greater than the moon. So the more mass, the, heavy, the greater the force of gravity, right? However, R, this R, the greater this R is, the less the force of gravity between these two masses, the, the attraction between these two masses, the less it will, uh, there will be if the further, the further apart they are. So how do we get rid of this proportionality sign? Well, some guy, Cavendish, derived, devised an experiment to find this, and he ended up coming up with a constant, a gravitational constant, G, big G, or capital G, and that is equal to 6.67 numerically, right? Times 10 to the negative 11 Newton meters squared over kg squared. So as you can see, that is a very, 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 very small number. That is zero followed by 11 zeros, and then a six, six, and seven. That is pretty much unnoticeable, right? And where did he get this from? Well, he placed two one kilogram mass objects, one meter apart. He placed their centers one meter apart from each other. So he had two little masses, right? Both weighing one kilogram and placed them one meter apart. And he had some sort of machine that he built, a very ingenious machine and he was able to calculate the force of gravity that these two objects were pulling on each other through, I don't know, some crazy methods. And he ended up finding out that these two one kilogram masses, so one kg, placed one meter apart, they were pulling on each other with this super, super small value of 6.67 times 10 to be negative 11 newtons. That is the force that this mass was pulling on this mass and this mass was pulling on this mass, right? That goes back to Newton's third law of motion. For every action force, there's an equal and opposite reaction force. The force that this is pulling on this is the same as this is pulling on this, right? So he derived this value as the force that these two masses were pulling on each other. And algebra the algebraic proof for that is, well... First, let's come up with the new formula, right? So Fg is equal to g times big M times small m all over r squared. So now that we have this g, we don't need this proportionality anymore, right? G gets rid of that proportionality. G says that we can use this g to find the force of gravity between any two masses and a radius because this g was found when these two masses were both one kilogram and one meter, their centers were one meter apart. So we can, this is just, this is basically just a product of um, G times this, right? And we can get our force of gravity because G is for the smallest of values being one kilogram and one meter apart. 
So we can prove g, right? So fg equals 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11 newtons times the bigger mass. Well, they're both one kilogram, so it doesn't matter where you put them. So times one kg times one kg all over r squared. So one meter squared. So 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11 newtons is equal to one kg squared sorry 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11 um newton meter squared over kg squared so meter squared over kg squared times one kg squared over one meter squared and from here we can cancel out this meter squared and this kg squared and we end up with a force of gravity between these two masses of 6.67 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11 newtons. So that is a proof of the force that these two masses are pulling on each other when placed one meter apart and at a mass of one kilogram. So now that we have that, we can solve pretty much every question in this section. So let's start with this one, right? So Fg equals G, so 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11 Newton meters squared over kg squared times the bigger mass being the sun. So where are we, we going to get that? The appendix. And here I have a picture of the appendix, the mass of the sun, 1.99. So times 1.99 times 10 to the 30th kg times the mass of the Earth. So that is over here. So 5.98 times 10 to the 24th kg all over the radius squared. The radius being, well, sorry, not the radius, the center to center distance. So the center to center distance comes from the mean radius of Earth's orbit. What does that mean? Well. Earth that orbits the sun. So if the sun is here, that mean radius between the Earth's orbit is essentially saying the, the distance between uh, the center of the Earth to the center of the sun. And what do we know about the center to center distance? Well, that's just r. So we can say divided by, um, well, here it says the mean radius of Earth's orbit is 1.49. So 1.49 times 10 to the 11th meters. And we square that, right? Because the force of gravity is inversely proportional to the, 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 the center to center distance. And it is directly proportional to the product of the masses. So Fg equals, you put that into your uh, calculators. It's going to be a lot of number crunching, but you'll end up with... 3.58 times 10 to the 22nd newtons and that's pretty much it that's the force that the sun is is uh pulling on the earth as well as the earth um pulling on the sun right they both have the same magnitude just opposite directions okay question two wants us to find the gravitational force between the earth and the moon so okay G equals G and small m all over r squared, where big M represents the Earth and small m represents the Moon. Um, use appendix B. So Fg equals six point six seven times ten to the uh, negative eleven Newton meters squared over uh, kg squared. of the earth that being from appendix b 5.98 times 10 to the 24th kg times the mass of the moon so 7.36 36 times 10 to the 22nd kg all that over the center to center diff distance. So that is just the orbital, uh, mean orbital radi radius of the moon. So we look for the mean radius of the moon's orbit, that being 3.48. So 3.48 times 10 
to the eighth, so to the eighth meters squared, three, sorry, 3.84. Put that all into your uh, calculators and you should get 1.99 times 10 to the 20th um, Newtons. Okay, question three, how far would we have to place two bowling balls weighing the same mass so that they would have this force uh, acting on each other? And would this be plausible or not? Okay, so Fg, that equals G M M over R squared, where both of these M's are the same, so it does not matter, right? So Fg R squared equals G M M R squared equals G M M over F G and R equals the root of that. So the root of G being 6.67 times 10 to be negative 11 Newton meters squared over kg squared. Let's bring this down over there. M being 7 kg. And the other M also being 7 kg. All over the force that they're pulling on each other with. So 1.2 uh, 5 times 10 to be negative 4 newtons. You end up getting an R approximately 5.11 times 10 to be negative 3 uh, meters, which is 0 0.511 centimeters. So is this plausible or not? Well, if you remember, R is the center to center distance. Can we place two bowling balls 0 0.5 centimeters apart? Well, probably not, right? Because the radius of a bowling ball is... I mean, I don't know what bowling balls you guys are using, but if you have a radius of a bowling ball that is smaller than this, then yeah, it's possible. But the radius of the bowling, of bowling ball is probably a lot greater than 0 0.5 centimeters. So in order for this to be hypothetically possible, these bowling balls would have to be overlapping each other so that their centers would be this distance apart but that is not possible so um to answer the question no this is not possible okay this time we're working on the uh, microscopic scale so we want to find the gravitational force between a electron and a proton in a hydrogen atom if they are this distance apart so fg equals g big m small m over r squared Fg equals 6.67 times 10 to be negative 11 Newton meters squared over kg squared times big M. So that is, we go to our appendix B. So the bigger the mass is, is the proton, which is 1.673 times 10 to be negative 27. So 1.673 times 10 to be negative 27. Uh, kilograms times the other mass, so that's the electron, 9.1 times. So 9.1 times 10 to be negative 33 um, kg, and all over the radius, the center center distance, so squared 5.3 times 10 to be negative 11 uh, meters squared. Plug that in and you should get a value of 3.61 times 10 to be negative 47 newtons. As you can see, this is a very, very small value, right? You compare that to the force that two one kilogram objects have, that's this. This value is a lot, lot smaller. This number, if we were to visualize it, you could probably fill the earth three times over with pennies. You could fill the surface of the earth three times over with pennies with this number. That's how big of a number it is, or how small of a number it is in this case. Okay, so on Venus, a person with a mass of 68 kg will weigh this many newtons. Find the mass of Venus from this given data. Okay, so Fg equals um, g, big M, small m, over uh, r squared. You want to solve for the mass of Venus, so let's rearrange for the big M. So Fg r squared is equal to Ig big M small m. And um, big M is equal to Fg r squared all over 
g times the small m. So let's find our, well, we have everything we need. Okay, so fg, we have that. That's um, 572. g, we know that. Our mass of the person is 68. And what is r? Well, r is the center to center distance, right? So here's Venus, right? And here is the our person. Obviously not the scale, right? But r would be the center to center distance. However, we're not given the center of this person. But in the case of this question, the center to cent the center of this person is such an insignificant number compared to the um, radius of Venus that we should only really be using the radius of Venus, right? Like the radius of an average person should be what, like one maybe one point five meters. That one point five meters is not going to do anything to this number, so we just use this number as our radius. So you can say m equals um, fg, that being 572 newtons, times the radius, so times 6.31 times 10 to the 6 meters squared, all over 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11 newton meters squared over kg squared, times the mass of the person, so 68 kg, plug that all in, and you should get a value of 5 times 10 to the 24th kg. Okay, in an experiment, a 8 kilogram lead sphere is brought close to a 1.5 kilogram mass. The gravitational force between them is 1.28 times 10 to the negative 8 newtons. How far apart are their uh, centers? Okay, so we're solving for R. I could derive this again, but if you remember, we derived this earlier, right? r is equal to the root of g big m small m all over fg so r equals the root of g um big m small m all over fg so our center to center distance that equals So 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11 Newton meters squared over kg squared times the bigger mass. So 8 kg times 1.5 kg all over the force between these two objects. So 1.28 times 10 to the negative 8 Newtons squared. So R, the center to center distance, is 0 0.25 meters or 25 centimeters apart. So that is how far their centers are from each other, these two masses. Okay, this is the last question in part eight of the physics review. So the radius of the planet Uranus is 4.3 times that of the radius of the Earth. The mass of Uranus is 14.7 times that of the Earth. How does the gravitational force on Uranus's surface compare to that of the Earth's surface? Okay, so let's define FG Earth. So the force, the gravitational force on Earth. So we can say that is um, G M small m all over R squared, right? That's what we've been working with this whole time. And we say that FG Uranus, so let's write this in red, FG Uranus is equal to, well, it has 14.7 times the Earth's mass. So G times 14.7 big M times the small m all over, well, it says we have 4.3 times the Earth's radius. So all over 4.3 um, R squared. Okay, so we can say that is equal to G times 14.7 m times small m all over so uh 4.3 squared that is uh 18.49 r squared and now we can just divide these two out or common factor them out so f g uranus equals so divide 
14.7 by 18.49, and you should get approximately 0 0.8 times g big M small m over r squared. And what did we define this to be? Well, we define this to be the fg of Earth. So we can also say fg Uranus is equal to 0 0.8 that of the uh, force of gravity on Earth, that Earth pulls. So yeah, that's it for part eight of the uh, physics units one to three review. Okay, so we're at the final part of the physics units one to three review, and this is the orbital motion section. So we're gonna be covering a little bit of centripetal force along with um, the gravitational constant formula. So say we have a planet orbiting the sun, so Earth, right? So here's our orbit, and this will be Earth, and this will be the sun. If you remember, let's make the sun a little bit bigger. So this will be the sun. If you remember from your centripetal force uh, unit, um, the what is the force or the centripetal force that's keeping this Earth in orbit? Well, that's the center-seeking force. And what is the center-seeking force? Well, that's our force of gravity, our Fg. And what do we know about this Fg? Well, we know that Fg is equal to g m m over r squared, right? That's what we've been working with this entire unit. So we can also say that this centripetal force, the force that is keeping this Earth, keeping the Earth in orbit, is Fg. So we can say that Fg equals Fc. So which Fg are we going to use? Well, we're going to say use g m m over uh, r squared, and that is equal to Fc. So mv squared over r, not squared, sorry. And with this formula, we can pretty much solve the rest of the questions. All right, uh, question nine, Jupiter's moon, Io, orbits Jupiter once every 1.769 days. Its average orbital radius is 4.216 times 10 to the eighth. What is Jupiter's mass? Okay, so let's use our Fg equals Fc, right? The centripetal force is the gravi is the gravitational force. So, g, big M, that being uh, Jupiter, small m, that being Jupiter's moon, all over r squared. So that's the orbital radius, and that's equal to m v squared over r. And for centripetal force, this r is also the orbital radius, right? Centripetal force works off what is the center, and this r goes towards the center, as well as this one. So, um, what do we have? What are we given? Well, we're given G. We're given these, these two R's. We're given, we want to find M. And we're not given any of these two M's. And we're not given V squared. So we can cancel out these M's, right? We've learned that before. But we're still going to have one more variable that we cannot solve for. So how are we going to solve for this? Okay, so we know that our centripetal force, right? Just like any force, it's equal to ma, where a is the centripetal acceleration. So that is equal to m times v squared over r, right? We just move it over here to get this nice looking formula. So v squared over r, so ac equals v squared over r right meters squared over second squared times one over meters that equals meters per second squared okay so we know that so we can also say that v because we're not given v and we want to find a new equation without v so v that is equal to the change in distance over the change in time so what is this change in distance? Well, right, the moon, Jupiter's moon, is orbiting Jupiter. 
in somewhat of a circle. Well, the further you go in into uh, physics, you'll know that you'll learn that this is no longer a circle. It's actually an ellipse. But for the sake of this question, we'll consider this a circle. So the change in D of a circle, that is just the diameter. And what is the formula for the diameter of a circle? Well, that's just 2 pi r. So ah, what is the time it takes to complete one revolution? Or one, or what is the time it takes for Jupiter's moon to complete this entire orbit? We call that the period, right? Period is in units. So t, which is what we denote as the symbol for the period. So t is in units of seconds per cycle. So how many seconds does it take to complete one cycle or seconds per revolution, right? They both mean the same thing. Okay, so now that we have a formula for V, we can plug this V back into here. So let's go down like this and say our centripetal acceleration, that's equal to V squared. So V being 2 pi r over all over t squared divided by r. So divided by r is the same thing as saying 1 over r. So times 1 over r. So times the reciprocal, right? So times 1 over r. So now let's just simplify this. So our centripetal acceleration is equal to, well, 2 squared is 4, pi squared is pi squared, and r squared is r squared. And then t squared, right? So 4 pi squared r squared all over t squared times 1 over r. We can cancel this r, and this becomes a 1. So now we're left with ac equals 4 pi squared r all over d period squared. And we know that fc is equal to mac, right? F net is equal to MA, FC is equal to MAC. And remember, no vector signs for this. So FC is equal to M4 pi squared R all over T squared. You're not going to have to remember the derivation for this, right? You just plug this simple formula in whenever you see a period or whenever you're given orbits Jupiter once every 1.769 days, we know that that is going to be the period. So whenever you see something like that, you can use this formula for FC. Okay, so now that we got that new FC formula, centripetal force formula, we can say that G, big M, small m, all over R squared is equal to uh, four, so sorry, M, 4 pi squared r all over t squared. Okay, so what do we want to find? We want to find Jupiter's mass. So we're going to have to isolate for big M, that is Jupiter's mass, and small m being the moon's mass, right? Okay, so let's start with cross multiplying. So big G, big M, small m times t squared is equal to m4 pi squared r and when we multiply this r squared to this this becomes r cubed so r cubed okay so we want to isolate for this guy so we can just divide this entire expression by g small m t squared right divide both sides by g small m t squared so we get m is equal to m4 pi squared r cubed all over uh, g m t squared. And as we said from the beginning, we can cancel out these m's, right? So we didn't need Jupiter's moon's mass, right? And we're left with uh, Jupiter's mass is equal to 4 pi squared r cubed all over g uh, t squared. Okay, so what are we given? Well, 4 pi cubed, 4 pi squared, well, that's pretty much a given, right? This g, it's a given. Um, we have the orbital radius, so we have r. And what is t? 
So we said t was seconds per cycle. In this case, how many seconds does it take to complete one revolution? And what is one revolution also known as? Well, one orbit. So it says Jupiter's moon orbits the orbits Jupiter once every 1.769 days. 69 days. So for every 1.769 days, we have one cycle or one revolution or one orbit, all meaning the same thing. So let's just write cycle, right? Cycle. Okay, so in 1.769 days, right? So for every one day, there is 24 hours. And in one hour, there is uh, 3,600 seconds. So let's do some dimensional analysis, right? Cancel these guys out. And you multiply that through, and you should get one. So let's see, one, five, two, eight, four, one point six seconds per cycle. So this is how many seconds it takes for uh, Jupiter's moon to orbit Jupiter one time. Okay, so now we can plug all our values in. So let's go over here and say, you know, let's go down here. So m is equal to 4 pi squared times r. So r being um, 4.216. So 4.216 times 10 to the um, eighth meters. So eighth meters, and that's cubed all over g being 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11 uh, newton meters squared over kg squared. And we multiply that by the period squared. So the period being 1528411.6. Seconds, we don't really have to put that cycles, right? Squared. Plug that all into your calculators, and you should get a mass of 1.9 times 10 to the 27th kg. And that makes sense, right? It's definitely greater than the Earth's uh, mass, and you should know that Jupiter's quite a lot bigger than the Earth. So, yeah. Um, that's the first orbital motion question. Let's get into the next one. Okay, question 10. Uh, Charon, the only known moon of the planet Pluto, has a orbital period of 6.387 days at an average distance of that many meters from Pluto. Uh, use Newton's form of Kepler's third law to find the mass of Pluto. Okay, so Kepler's law, the third law, also known as Kepler's constant or the harmonic law. It's just a relationship between the period squared over the radius cubed similar to the relationships we looked back to during the gravitational constant unit i'm not really gonna talk more about this as this is not part of the review however we're just while solving this question i'll come back to it so um this is pretty similar to the previous question we're pretty much gonna use the same formula but i guess i'll just derive it again right so fg equals the centripetal force fg also known as g big m small m over r squared and that is equal to m4 pi squared r over t squared right we're using the expanded version of this centripetal force because we are given the period so um let's cross multiply t squared g big m small m and that is equal to m4 pi squared r cubed right uh divide both sides by t squared big g small m and we're left with m equals m4 pi squared r cubed all over um t squared let's put g at the front so all over g t squared let's put m here mgt squared we can cancel out these m's and we're left with 4 pi squared r cubed all over g 
t squared, right? Same formula that we had in the previous question. Okay, so back to Kepler's law, right? It was the relationship between the period squared and the radius cubed. Here we can see Kepler's law, however, it is inverse. So it is a relationship between the, the inverse of this period squared and the r cubed. Again, I'm not really getting it too deep into Kepler's laws. However, it is just a relationship, and I'm pretty sure it was discovered before the gravitational constant formula, and it was help, it helped Newton to derive um, the um, gravitational constant, or not Newton, Cavendish. But yeah, so now we can just plug all our values in. So m equals four pi squared times r being um, 1.9640 times 10 to the seventh meters cubed all over g so 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11 newton meters squared over kg squared times the period squared so the period as you said it before uh, seconds per cycle so uh, 6.387 days per cycle so let's just write per c times one day 24 hours one hour uh 3600 seconds multiply that all out and you should get a period of 551,836.8 seconds per cycle. Okay, plug that into your period. So 551,836.8 uh, seconds squared. And you get a mass. So let's write the mass here. So you should get a mass of 1.47 times 10 to the 22nd kg. So that is how heavy, um, or that is the mass of Pluto. Okay. So question 11, some weather satellites orbit Earth uh, every 90 minutes. How far above the Earth's surface is their orbit? Okay. So this is a little different than the previous ones. So let's start with our fg equals fc we're going to be using the expanded one because we're given the period the expanded centripetal force formula so um g big m small m over r squared is equal to m4 pi squared r over t squared we're solving for r so let's just cross multiply real quick so g big m small m times t squared is equal to m4 pi squared r cubed. So r cubed is equal to, um, let's divide both sides by m4 pi squared, right? So g m t squared over um, 4 pi squared, right? We canceled out these m's and we divide by 4 pi squared. Okay, so R, the center to center distance is G M T squared over four pi squared cube rooted, or you can just multiply this to the third as that it's the same thing. Okay, so R is equal to the root, the cube root of g so 6.67 times 10 to be negative 11 newton uh, meters squared over kg squared times the mass of the earth so we go back to our notes so the mass of the earth being 5.98 times 10 to the 24th so times 5.98 times 10 to the 24th kg uh, times the period squared Okay, so we're gonna have to find the period once again, right? So 90 minutes per cycle, one minute, there is 60 seconds. So 90 times 60, that is 5,400 uh, seconds 
per cycle. You could write, you don't really have to write that. For this, so 5,400 uh, seconds all over 4 pi squared. So R ends up being uh, 6, 6, 5, four zero three two meters so six million six hundred and fifty four thousand thirty two meters something like that and this is where the different part of the question comes in so it asks how far above earth's surface is their orbit okay so say this is earth we just found the satellite say the satellite is over here and this is the center of earth so this r right center to center distance so that is this distance right here we want to find how far this satellite is above the surface of the earth so what we're looking for is this distance right here this is the surface of the earth and we want to find this distance how far above the surface of the earth this satellite lies so we're given r which is the center to center distance so let's say d that's like the distance how far above the certain uh, center of the earth is so d is equal to let's call this r so d is equal to r minus see that's the thing with labeling this r right we get it confused with the radius. So we'll call the radius of Earth capital R lowercase e. So minus uh, this length right here. So this length minus this length equals d, this length, which is how far above the surface of the Earth the satellite lies. So don't get confused with this r as a radius. This r is the center to center distance, and this r e, that's our radius of the Earth. So d equals center to center distance minus r e. So what is the radius of the Earth? Well, we have it here. So the mean radius of the Earth is 6.38 times 10 to be 6 meters. So 6.38 times 10 to be 6 meters. Subtract those two numbers together, and you should get D equals 274.032 meters. So V satellite is 274,032 meters above the Earth's surface. This guy's the satellite. We put it out this many meters above the Earth's surface, and it orbits around this Earth um, in 90 minutes. So yeah, that's... Um, a different type of possible question we could have for orbital motion. Let's move on to the next one. Okay, question 12. How fast is the moon moving as it orbits the Earth at a distance of 3.84 times 10 to the fifth kilometers? All right, so FG equals FC, IG, M, small m, over R squared. And this time we're going to be using the regular uh, centripetal force formula. So MV squared over r right there's no need to expand it okay so we want to find the speed so let's isolate for v squared so let's cross multiply first so mv squared r squared is equal to g big m small m times r let's divide both sides by m and r squared so um, v squared is equal to g big m small m times r over m r squared cancel these m's this r goes away and this turns into a, a one so we're left with the is equal to g m all over r and we square root right we square root both sides to get rid of the square and we're left with v equals the root of g m all over r okay so v that is equal to the root of G being 6.67 times 10 to the um, negative 11 Newton meters squared over kg squared. And the M, so the mass of the Earth. So remember that being 5.98 
times tan to the 24th kg, right from the appendix B of the book, all over the center to center distance, that being the orbital distance. So that being 3.84 times 10 to the fifth kilometers or in meters. So 3.84 times 10 to the eighth meters, right? Just multiply by 1,000. And we got 3.84 times 10 to the eighth meters. Plug that all in. And you should get a velocity of 1,019 meters per second, right? This velocity is for the moon. Why? Well, if you look at this equation, it uses small m, and we know small m is for the moon. And why does it use small m? Well, if you remember, centripetal force is the force that keeps an object in motion in a circular path, right? And the object that's moving in a circular path is the moon, right? It's not the Earth. The Earth is stationary. Well, stationary until you get to Kepler's laws, but for now, we say it's stationary, and the moon is orbiting it, right? Thus why the V is related to the uh, speed of the moon. All right, uh, question 13. So on each of the Apollo lunar missions, the command module was placed in a very low, approximately circular orbit above the moon. Assume that the average height was 60 kilometers above the surface and that the moon's radius is 77, 38 kilometers. Okay, it says approximately circular orbit because in reality, it is a elliptical orbit, but once again, we don't get into that until Kepler's laws. Okay, so let's draw a little diagram of what's going on. So here's our moon, and here they place the command module, right? Okay, so what is what was the command module's orbital period? Okay, so this time we're solving for t. So fc that equals fg or let's do it the other way so fg that equals fc so big g big m small m all over r squared and we're using the expanded version of centripetal force right all over t squared and we want to isolate for t so let's cross multiply first so t squared times g big m small m is equal to m 4 pi squared r cubed right multiply both the r's and divide both sides by g big m small m so t squared is equal to m 4 pi squared r cubed all over g big m small m cancel these m's square root both sides and we're left with t equals the root of 4 pi squared R cubed all over a uh, G big M. So that's T. Okay, so what are we given? We're given G, right? This is pretty much a given, 4 and pi. The mass of the moon, big M, right? We can find that from our appendix B and the center to center distance. Okay, so let's find the center to center distance. So say this is the center of the moon it says that the average height was 60 kilometers above the surface of the moon okay so the average height of this um satellite was uh 60 kilometers above the surface of the moon right average height because the orbit is elliptical that just means oval shaped right or maybe not oval shaped but close to oval shaped so let's say this over here let's do this in white so that is 60 kilometers. And it says the moon's radius is seven. Let's draw this in blue. So the moon's radius is seven, seven, three, eight kilometers. So if we want to the center to center distance, we just add these two together, right? So seven, seven, three, eight plus 60 kilometers. That equals seven seven nine eight kilometers. Multiply that by a thousand. So therefore, r the center to center distance is um seven seven eight seven seven nine eight. Sorry, zero 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 meters. So that is the center to center distance from the 
um, center of the moon to the center of the um, command module, right? We're not really given the center of the command module, but given how small this guy is compared to this, um, compared to this entire distance, even if we were given it, it would barely make any difference, right? It's pretty much negligible. Okay, so now let's plug in all our values. So T equals the root of four pi squared times that center to center distance being seven, seven, nine, eight, zero, zero, zero meters uh, cubed. And that's all over G. So 6.67 times 10 to be negative 11 Newton uh, meters squared over kg squared times the mass of the moon. So go to appendix B. The mass of the moon is 7.36 times 10 to the 20 second. So times 10 to the 20 second kg. And we end up with a T being, or the period being 61,752 seconds per orbit cycle revolution i'm just gonna say per orbit you could write cycle revolution right so it takes this module 61,752 seconds to complete one orbit around the moon okay so part b how fast was the command module moving in its orbit so that's just a basic fg equals fc question right just rearranged for v and we're going to be using the regular uh centripetal force uh formula so that's g big m small m all over r squared and that's equal to um mv squared over r so cross multiply is equal to mv squared over r divide both sides by m and r so v squared equals g um sorry this is gonna be r squared so divide both sides by um m and r squared so we end up getting g uh big m all over r squared and v ends up being the root of that so root g big m over r squared and we're pretty much given all this stuff right or we found the center to center distance so g being 6.67 times sorry times 10 to the negative 11 times the mass of the moon so 7.36 times 10 to the 22nd all over this r that we found so 7 7 uh, nine eight zero 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 meters squared and we end up getting a v equal to uh seven ninety three point four meters per second all right so that's pretty much it but i want to add one more thing although the question doesn't mention now that we have the um v we have our velocity or speed and we have our um we have the time it takes to complete one uh revolution we can use our classic dvt formula right so we can say the distance is equal to v times t and what is this distance well just for fun let's calculate the distance that this entire that this module travels around the um moon right let's ca calculate the distance of the orbit of this module so you don't have to do this but just a cool little proof right so d is equal to 793.4 meters per second times the time it takes to complete one revolution so that being um six one seven five two seconds per orbit you don't really have to write per orbit or per anything but for the sake of this question i'm going to write that and we end up getting a distance of 4.89 times 10 to the seventh meters so this module orbits around this moon 
over 4.89 times 10 to the seventh meters at a speed of 793.4 meters per second during a time duration of um, 61,752 uh, seconds. Okay, uh, question 14. So a star is at the edge of the Andromeda galaxy. It appears to be orbiting the center of that galaxy. So let's say this is the Andromeda galaxy, right? Pretty circular, well, kind of. And here's the center of the galaxy. And we have some star, right? At the edge of the galaxy and it's orbiting around it. So, um, it is orbiting around it at a speed of two times 10 to the second kilometers per second. And the star is about five times 10 to the ninth AU from the center of the galaxy. So what is an AU? Well, an AU is essentially the same distance as the Earth's orbital radius, um, which is 1.49 times 10 to the eighth. So they want us to estimate the mass of the Andromeda galaxy. All right, so let's start off with FG equals FC. So big G, big M, small m, equal to mv squared over r, right? We're using the regular formula for centripetal force. We're not giving any information about the period, and we have enough information to solve for our big M. So we're isolating for um, big M. So let's cross multiply first. So G big M small m times R is equal to R squared mv squared. Um, divide both sides by G M R. So that is equal to R squared and B squared all over um, G small m times R. So our big mass is equal to V squared times R all over uh, G, right? These this turns into E1. This goes away. This is out. Okay, so... Let's find v squared and let's find our r. We're given g. Okay, so let's find um, let's find the center to center distance first. Okay, so we know that this is five times ten to the ninth au from the center of the from the center of the galaxy. That's how far this star is from here. And to put that in perspective, only one au. Well, one au is one point four nine times ten to the eighth kilometers, which we're gonna have to turn into meters. So this is five times 10 to the ninth of this. So that is a huge number. That's how far this star is away from the center of the uh, galaxy. And because that number is so huge and we're not given the radius of the star, we don't even need it because the radius of the star is gonna be so insignificant to the uh, distance from the center of the galaxy to the center of the star, right? Similar to how we um, had those problems back in the other questions where the radius of a human was so insignificant to the radius of the earth that's how big the radius of this galaxy is or the center of this galaxy to this star is it's huge okay so now that we have that out of the way we can say that um five times ten to the ninth au and let's just use some simple um, dimensional analysis, right? So times one AU for every 1.49 times 10 to the eighth kilometers. Multiply that by um, 1,000. So one for every one kilometer, we have 8,000 meters, sorry. 8,000 meters. So multiply that all out and you should get a value of 7.45 times 10 to the 20th meters that is 745 followed 745 followed by 20 zeros that is a huge number so now that we have the center to center distance all we need to find is our velocity or speed so 2 times 10 to the second kilometers per second and one kilometer that is 1000 meters 
and we're left with uh, meters per second, so we don't have to do anything else. Multiply that out, and you should get 2 times 10 to the fifth meters per second, or 200,000 meters per second. Okay, so let's go up here. Let's say that's the mass of this galaxy that is equal to v being 2 times 10 to the fifth meters per second squared times the center to center distance so 7.45 times 10 to the 20th meters all over g so 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11 newton uh meters squared over kg squared and we end up with a mass of this galaxy of 4.47 times 10 to the 41 kg that is a huge mass very big all right question 15 this is going to be a little bit of a longer question so the polar orbiting environmental satellites poes and some military satellites orbit at a much lower level in order to obtain more detailed information so poes completes an orbit 14.1 times per day what are the orbital speed and the altitude of the poes so this is a two-parter okay so fg that equals fc so g big m small m all over r squared is equal to mv squared over r. i guess i should draw a diagram of what's going on so here is the earth and we have the pos satellite orbiting around the earth at some distance above the earth and i'll say this is the center of the earth okay so we can they want us part a wants us to find the speed but we're not given r so we can't find the speed right we have g we have this big m and we can cancel these small m's but we also need one more variable in, in order to solve for v so we can't solve for r just yet but we have another formula we can use to plug in to solve for r to then which we will use that r to find our v okay so let me show what i mean by that so we have g m m over r squared and we have the expanded version of this centripetal force right so that is m4 pi squared r all over uh, t squared so as you can see now we have all we have we're, well we're gonna find t we have m we have this pi right m g cancel out these m's and we can find our r and from there we can plug it into here and solve for our v okay so i guess let's find our t right that's the first well you know what? let's rearrange this first okay so cross multiply right g big m small m times t squared is equal to m4 pi squared times r cubed um divide so divide both sides by m4 pi squared and cube root both sides so we end up with the cube root of um g big m small m t squared over m4 pi squared we can get rid of these m's these small m's and we can um and that's it we, that's all we can do okay so now let's find our t so it's it says that um an orbit 14.1 it takes it makes 14.1 orbits per day so that is in cycles per day so that is our frequency so the frequency is equal to 14.1 per day so 14.1 cycles per day and frequency is in cycles per second otherwise known as hertz however i'm going to turn this into a period um expression because i prefer to work with per the period formula and it just makes everything a lot easier to visualize in my opinion so let's turn this into the period so the period is just the inverse of the frequency so just reciprocal this right so t equals day one day 14.1 and this would be orbits right or cycles right 
and we want this in cycles per second so let's multiply this so one day in one day there is 24 hours and in one hour there is 3600 seconds so multiply this all out and you should get a period or a new period of um, 6,127.7 um, seconds per cycle or orbit. So it takes this satellite 6,127.7 seconds to complete one orbit, right? The previous uh, given information said that it takes, it completes 14.1 orbits per day now we're just turning this into how many seconds it takes to complete one or orbit right just reciprocal the frequency and solve for t using dimensional analysis okay so we have vt now we can pretty much solve for r so r is equal to the root of g so that is 6.67 sorry the third root of 6.67 times 10 to be negative 11 Newton meters squared over kg squared times the mass of the Earth. So from your appendix B, that's 5.98 times 10 to be 24 kg times the period that we just found. So times 6127.7 seconds squared all over uh, 4 pi squared. Okay, so put that into your calculators and your R or your center to center distance ends up being seven, two, three, nine, one, four, seven meters. So that is the distance between the center of the earth to the satellite. Okay, so we can either solve for um, the speed or the altitude of the satellite first. It does not really matter. And I feel like it'd be better to solve for the altitude first given that we pretty much found the center to center distance and it's convenient to just work for the altitude first, right? So what is the altitude? Well, the altitude is from the surface of the earth to the, um, to the um, satellite. So this, this distance. So we're given uh, this distance, right? This is our R, the center to center distance. So all we do is my uh, subtract this r so we can say altitude altitude is equal to r the center to center distance minus the radius of the earth right so minus this distance so this minus this equals this distance which is the altitude from the surface of the earth to the satellite Okay, so minus R E. So R being seven two three nine one four seven meters. And the radius of the earth, get that from appendix B. So that is um six point three eight times ten to be sixth. So time minus six point three eight times ten to be sixth meters. And we end up getting an altitude of um eight hundred thousand eight hundred and fifty nine thousand one hundred and forty seven uh meters so that is the uh distance from the surface of the earth to the satellite and now we can just solve part uh b so or i'll just say this is i i and this will be i okay so let's solve part two and they want us to um find the orbital speed so pretty much just plug our r back into this and we solve for v so let's isolate for v so let's rewrite this so g big m small m over uh r squared is equal to m v squared over r so g big m small m times r is equal to m v squared times r squared divide both sides by m by m r squared and square root both sides so we end up getting big g big m small m times r all over um m 
r squared. This goes away, this turns into a 1, and these guys go away. So we get v equals the root of g big M all over r. And we plug in our values. So 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11 Newton meter squared over kg squared times the mass of the earth so appendix b 5.98 times 10 to the 24th so 5.98 times 10 to the 24th kg all over r which we found over here the center to center distance so 7 to 3 9 1 4 7 meters and we end up getting a final velocity or speed of 7,423 uh, meters per second. Therefore, this satellite is traveling at 7,423 meters per second at an altitude of um, 859,147 meters above the Earth. And it takes um, it takes six thousand one hundred and twenty seven point seven seconds to complete one orbit, or it completes fourteen point one orbits per day. Okay. Okay. Question sixteen. This is the second last uh, question in this review. So the International Space Station orbits at an altitude of approximately two hundred and twenty six kilometers. What is its orbital speed, and what is the period? So this is another two parter. So let's draw a diagram. Here's the Earth. This will be these. Let's make this a little bit bigger. So here's the Earth. This is the center. And we have some space station, the ISS, and it's orbiting around the Earth. And it has a altitude of 226 kilometers. So this is the altitude. And we want to find its orbital speed in this period. All right. So we know we're gonna have to find r, right? We've done enough questions so that we know that r is uh, is one of the most important um, pieces of information we need to solve these questions. So what is r? Well, r is the center to center distance, and we have the altitude, and we have the radius of the Earth from the appendix, right? So we can say that r equals the radius of the Earth plus the altitude. So r equals the radius of the Earth. So from the appendix, the radius of the Earth is 6.38. So 6.38 times 10 to the sixth meters plus the altitude. So that's 226 kilometers. So multiply that by 1,000 to get into meters. And we end up getting um, 226,000 uh meters so that plus 226 thousand uh, meters and we get our center to center distance to be uh six million six hundred and six uh, thousand okay so now we can just solve for either or right so fc or fg equals fc and it just depends which one we want to solve first so let's solve the speed first so fg that equals um well sorry g big m small m over r squared that equals mv squared over r let's cross multiply rg big m small m is equal to mv squared over r squared let's isolate for v by square rooting both sides and dividing them both by m and r squared so this m goes away this goes away and this becomes one so we end up getting, um, and this goes away too because we square root. So V equals the root of G big M all over R, right? So V equals the square root of G 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11 times the mass of the earth. So 5.98 times 10 to the 24th, right? From... Uh, appendix B, 5.98 times 10 to the 24th, all over um, the center to center distance, so 600 and 6,606,000 uh, 
meters, plug that all into your calculators, and you should get a speed of 7,770 meters per second. Okay, so that was part A or part one, so part one. Now let's do part two, so part two. We wanna solve for the period, so FG equals FC, and we can say that um, G big M small M over R squared equals the expanded version of the centripetal force formula, so M four pi squared R all over T squared, cross multiply, so T squared G big M small M, that's equal to M four pi squared times R cubed, Let's isolate for t squared, divide both sides by g, m, m, and square root both sides. So t equals the root of 4 pi squared r cubed all over g, big m. So right, we cancel these m's out. This gets goes away because we square root. Okay, um, let's go up here. So the period equals the root of 4 pi squared times the center to center distance so 600 6 million 606 so 6 million 606 thousand meters uh times uh to the power of three all over g so 6.67 times 10 to be negative 11 times the mass of the earth, so 5.98 times 10 to the 24th kg. Okay, so T ends up equaling 5,341.6 uh, seconds per orbit. Therefore, the International Space Station is traveling at a speed of 7,000 770 meters per second and it is completing one orbit around the earth in 5341.6 seconds all right uh question 17 this is the last question of the review so the planet neptune has an orbital radius around the sun of about 4.5 times 10 to the 12th meters what are its period and its orbital speed so this is a two-part question or a two part part A. So I guess let's draw a diagram. So this is the sun and over here we'll have um, Neptune. This will be their centers. And Neptune is orbiting around the sun and we're given the orbital radius. So that's the distance from the center to center of these two masses. Okay, so let's solve for the orbital speed first. We can solve for either, but it's easier to solve for the orbital speed first. So FG equals FC. So big G, big M over times M over R squared is equal to MV squared over R. We're isolating for V, so let's cross multiply first. So uh, R squared V squared is R squared V squared m is equal to uh, g big m small m times r divide both sides by m r squared and square root so v is equal to the root of g big m small m times r all over r squared times m cancel out these m's this r goes away and this r squared turns into just r so v equals the root of g big M all over R. So let's plug in our values. G, so 6.67 times 10 to be negative 11 Newton meters squared over K G squared times the mass of the sun, right? Big M being the mass of the sun. So we go to our appendix B, we look for the mass of the sun and the mass of the sun is 1.99 times 10 to the 30th kg so times 1.99 times 10 to the 30th kilograms all over the center to center distance so that is given to us 4.5 times 10 to the 12 meters 
So 4.5 times 10 to the 12th meters. So we end up getting a speed of 5,431 meters per second. Part two of part A wants us to find the period. So FG, that equals FC, big G, big M, times M, over um, R squared. And that equals the expanded formula for our centripetal force, right? We're given, we want to find the period. So we're gonna use that formula. So M for pi squared times R all over T squared. And we just isolate for T, right? So cross multiply. So T squared times G big M small M is equal to M for pi squared times R, R cubed, right? And we square root both sides and divide by g, big M, small m. So t is equal to the root of m4 pi squared r cubed all over g, big M, small m. Cancel out these small m's. And we're left with t equals the root of 4 pi squared r cubed all over g, big M. So we go up here and we say t is equal to the root of 4 pi squared times r being the center to center distance, which is given to us 4.5 times 10 to the 12 meters cubed all over g 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11 newton meters squared over kg squared uh, times the big M, so the mass of the sun. So times 1.99 times 10 to the 30th kg. And we end up getting a period of 52060601777 seconds. Pretty large number. And that's how long it takes for um, Neptune to complete one orbit around the sun. So that many seconds per orbit, per cycle, per revolution, whatever you feel most comfortable in uh, using. All right, uh, question 17. This is the last question of the review. So the planet Neptune has an orbital radius around the sun of about 4.5 times 10 to the 12 meters. What are its period and its orbital speed? So this is a two-part question, or a two-part part A. So I guess let's draw a diagram. So this is the sun, and over here we'll have um, Neptune. This will be their centers, and Neptune is orbiting around the sun, and we're given the orbital radius. So that's the distance from the center to center of these two masses. Okay, so let's solve for the orbital speed first. We can solve for either, but it's easier to solve for the orbital speed first. So FG equals FC. So big G, big M over times M over R squared is equal to MV squared over R. We're isolating for V, so let's cross multiply first. So uh, R squared, V squared is R squared V squared m is equal to uh, g big m small m times r divide both sides by m r squared and square root so v is equal to the root of g big m small m times r all over r squared times m cancel out these m's this r goes away and this r squared turns into just r so v equals the root of g big M all over R. So let's plug in our values. G, so 6.67 times 10 to be negative 11 Newton meters squared over K G squared times the mass of the sun, right? Big M being the mass of the sun. So we go to our appendix B, we look for the mass of the sun and the mass of the sun is 1.99 times 10 to the 30th kg so times 
0.99 times 10 to the 30th kilograms all over the center to center distance. So that is given to us 4.5 times 10 to the 12 meters. So 4.5 times 10 to the 12 meters. So we end up getting a speed of 5,431 meters per second. So part two of part A wants us to find the period. So FG, that equals FC, big G, big M, times M, over um, R squared. And that equals the expanded formula for our centripetal force, right? We're given, we want to find the period. So we're gonna use that formula. So M for pi squared times R all over T squared. And we just isolate for T, right? So cross multiply. So T squared times G big M small M is equal to M for pi squared times R, R cubed, right? And we square root both sides and divide by g, big M, small m. So t is equal to the root of m4 pi squared r cubed all over g, big M, small m. Cancel out these small m's. And we're left with t equals the root of 4 pi squared r cubed all over g, big M. So we go up here and we say t is equal to the root of four pi squared times r being the center to center distance, which is given to us 4.5 times 10 to the 12 meters cubed all over g 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11 Newton meters squared over kg squared uh, times the Big M, so the mass of the sun. So times 1.99 times 10 to the 30th kg. And we end up getting a period of 5206060177 seconds. Pretty large number. And that's how long it takes for um, Neptune to complete one orbit around the sun. So that many seconds per orbit, per cycle, per revolution, whatever you feel most comfortable in uh, using. Okay, uh, part B. So part B wants us to find how many orbits Neptune has completed since its discovery in 1846, assuming that the current year is the book that this is the year that this book had been written so that being 2011 so 2011 minus 1846 that equals 165 years so how many orbits has neptune completed in 165 years so we just use some dimensional dimensional analysis right so 5206 zero six zero one seven seven seconds um per orbit so per orbit and we know that there's three thousand six hundred seconds in an hour there is 24 hours in a day and there is 365 days in a year and we want to find out how many orbits this completed in 165 years. So this is 165 years, years since discovery. So we can just write uh, discovery on the top. We cancel out all the units. So seconds, seconds, hours, hours, days, days, years, years, and we're left with discovery over orbit so whatever number we get will be how many orbits have occurred since the discovery so put that into your um, calculators right and you should get a value of approximately one so the planet neptune since its discovery in 1846 has completed only one orbit around um around the sun so one year is 
this many seconds, right? Uh, a year is defined as how long it takes for a planet to orbit its host star, that being the sun. So it takes Neptune 165 years to uh, complete one year. Well, for a Neptune year, right? But yeah, that's it. We're done the physics units one to three review. Um, I hope you understand everything and thanks for watching.